Hey everybody, Faraday here. So today um, I've got non-compete and destiny here. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know me, my name's Caleb Kane. Oh, hold on, let me mute that. Shit. Okay, sorry about that. For, okay, so to anybody that doesn't know me, my name's Caleb Kane. Uh, I run the channel, YouTube channel Faraday Speaks where I talk about my experiences within the alt-right. Uh, I uh, also run a Discord server where we try to de-radicalize people in far-right um, extreme ideologies. Um, so today I've got with me Non-Compete and Destiny, and I noticed a couple months ago they were having a... I don't know if you guys had a back and forth on Twitter, but I saw that non I don't... Uh, EJ, I saw oh, that you were, like, wanting to talk to him, and so I sent Destiny an email, and I thought we'd just go ahead and set it up. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Go ahead, uh, EJ. Yeah, yeah, we didn't really have a back and forth. I, I made a video that referenced Destiny. It wasn't like a takedown video, but it was just like, at that time, there was a lot of uh, discussion on like the far left. I'm a far leftist, so a lot of far leftists were like, is Destiny a leftist? Should we, you know, stand Destiny or whatever? And I was like, I guess I made a video that was just like, Destiny's doing good things, but we need to do good things also and not just like... No, if, I'm talking about Destiny Third Person. I know you're here. <laughs> but how rude of me. But um, yes, yeah, so that was what the video was about. It wasn't really like a takedown of Destiny, but just that like the far left needs people like Destiny who are doing the work that Destiny is doing to like de-radicalize fascists. Because that's something I admire about what you're doing, Destiny. Um, and I just want to see more far leftists doing kind of the same kind of thing. So that's kind of where it, this all came from for me, I think. Okay. Destiny, you want to introduce yourself for anybody that doesn't know you? Yeah, I'm, my name is Stephen Bonnell. I go by Destiny Online. I do a lot of political and gaming content on Twitch.tv, and then I also have my YouTube channel that's Destiny as well. I do a lot of political and gaming content there. Okay, so uh, I figured uh, we... Uh, I know uh, EJ wanted to talk about anarchism and socialism, and I've seen... Obviously, everybody knows that a lot of lefties have been coming after Destiny on Twitter, uh, there was a debate that he did with Peter Coffin. So mm -hmm. I figured EJ could just ask you some questions about anarchism or, or your beliefs, and he could tell you about some of his, and you guys could have back and forth on that. So EJ, I'll go ahead and let you take the floor there. Yeah, sure. And I didn't actually introduce myself. I'm just, I run the channel Non-Compete, uh, and it's, we're, you know, me and my uh, partner Luna, who's actually in the room with me, um, she's a Vietnamese Marxist-Leninist in the Ho Chi Minh school, and I'm an anarchist, uh, anarcho-communist, but we still managed to get along. But uh, so, yeah, so I guess from watching the Peter Coffin debate, that's where I guess I'd like to begin. Um, I know you, you both touched on anarcho-communism a little bit, but like didn't really go down the road a lot. So I guess my first question would just be, what is your, you know, just to get the lexicon jiving, what, what, how do you view anarchism or how would you define anarchism or is like, is anarcho-communism where basically your goal is to eliminate or dissolve like a state and then have your communist society, not by way of like some political process, but by, by just like the actual dissolution of the state. That, that's kind of my understanding of it. Yeah, there, there are many different forms of anarchism and anarcho-communism, and we don't all agree with each other, but the basic rule of thumb, well, the, the so uh, for us, communism follows anarchism because the basic idea, the core idea of anarchism for most of us is elimination of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So anarchism means no hierarchies or, or dissolving unjust hierarchies and so for us the reason we, we view communism as a necessity is because we think capitalism is inherently an unjust hierarchy so um so yeah but the, but we uh we do call for dismantling the state and, but that doesn't mean eliminating like all forms of government we just think people should be self-governed to whatever extent possible so we see this like we, we define the state perhaps differently than like the mainstream definition. So for us, a state is a political entity that enforces or, you know, works towards the goals of an elite class, you know, so that there's one group over others. Um, and in modern times, the state tends to be a capitalist state. You know, most states around the world are capitalist states. And we believe that states basically serve the interests of the elite capitalist class and the wealthy more than they do the working class and people with disabilities and that sort of thing. Um, so that's, yeah, that would be my personal definition. And I think most anarcho-communists would generally agree with that. Okay. Um, um, where do we want to start? Yeah. So I guess, um, I guess, I guess my first question would be like, where w do you think capitalism is like a good thing or do you think it's like a necessary evil or, I mean, 
Do I think what, what is a is capitalism a good thing cap, or a capitalism? Um, yeah, like what's your view of capitalism generally? I don't think I ascribe like any 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 morality to capitalism. Like I think I would just say that like it, it is what it is. Um, I, I guess like I would say like markets exist. Like basic uh, observations we can make about capitalism seem to be true, and then that's it. I, I, I don't know how I would ascribe like a moral good or bad to. Um, yeah, I guess I don't mean morally, but like pragmatically, do you think that it is an a f effective, good, well-functioning system? Um, or do you think that like, I, I, yeah, I mean, because to me, I get the impression that you generally think that capitalism is like an efficient, reasonable way of, of organizing our economy. Yeah, I, um, I would say so. Yeah, I think so. Okay, okay. I just want to make sure we're on the same page about that. Mm -hmm. So, so like, what do you see as like the strengths of capitalism? Uh um, basically the idea that I guess like, um, investment can go where markets dictate it goes, that labor can go. Um, I guess I should have like a better, like broader definition, but I, I guess basically that resources are allocated in an economy in a way that like markets dictate, which takes care of any kind of like very complicated central planning question, which is really hard to do efficiently at scale. But yeah, I guess like in a really broad sense, capitalism just seems to allocate resources where they need to be. And that's kind of why I'm in favor of it. Okay. And how do you, how do you kind of like... How does that uh, reconcile with the fact that there's so much wealth inequality and so many of our resources are in like such a small group of hands where we have like 50 families that have like 50% of the wealth? I mean, where, um, do you that think might that be the most economically efficient way to organize that capital. Um, but that's where capitalism stops. Um, I wouldn't expect capitalism to deliver a, a society where everybody has an equal amount of wealth. Um, I would expect capitalism to allocate resources as economically efficiently as possible. And then any type of redistribution would have to take place with another sort of system. So, for instance, like your tax policy or some sort of welfare or something like that. Okay. So, why, why do you like? Uh, why hasn't it uh, th around the world? Why why is there so much poverty? Why is there so much wealth inequality? If capitalism is so efficient at like putting wealth where it needs to go, like why do we have all of these major problems with specifically resources being allocated? Uh, so overwhelmingly into such a small number of hands, you know? Um, so, yeah, so, like, I, I think we have to be really careful what we say. So, like, I think when you say allocating wealth where it needs to go, I think you've kind of loaded this with the idea that, like, poor people need more money so that we can balance out inequality. I don't think that resources, I, I don't think that that's the most economically efficient way to distribute a resource necessarily. Um, this is something that has to be addressed with a tax policy. So I wouldn't expect, so to reiterate, I wouldn't expect capitalism to give everybody like, for instance, a living wage or access to healthcare or something. I just don't, I, I don't think that that economic system intrinsically does that. What I would expect it to do is uh, allocate resources as efficiently as possible to give you an economy that's as efficient as possible. And then your goal would be, if you think that people deserve health care or higher wages or something, then you have to augment that with some sort of government policy. So like minimum wage or some kind of universal health care system. Okay. Uh, do you not feel like there's a, a power imbalance in terms of the fact that like in a capitalist society, wealth is a form of power. It's probably the predominant form of power. And so when you have people who have so much wealth concentrate, like Jeff Bezos or mm -hmm. something like that, who has billions and billions of dollars, um, that gives them would you agree that that gives them like a tremendous amount of power as an individual to influence and control these systems uh, perhaps in ways that are inefficient? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of different statements in here. So firstly, I don't think that hierarchies are by definition bad or that power is by definition bad. Um, I don't think anybody would, would agree with either of those two things. Um, and we can talk about those at more at length if you want. But I mean, I don't think that our systems that are involved in regulating our economy should also be subject to rent-seeking um, actors that, that are reaping the rewards of the economy as well. So obviously, um, a very wealthy individual that's making money off of some... Um, some activity that might be a detriment to society probably shouldn't have a great say or a larger say than somebody else in how government runs because obviously you have a huge conflict of interest there. I mean, so I guess where I would sort of start to come in with my perspective is that I feel like the billionaires of the world and the capitalist corporations of the world have demonstrably uh, throughout modern history been a detriment to society. They have done uh, damage and harm to people around the world. You know, um, I don't I don't see I guess I, I feel like the burden of evidence is on the capitalist side of things to prove how capitalism has benefited humanity. And I know that there are like, for instance, the World Bank statistics that say that like millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. But um, the World Bank is like. A capitalist 
oriented institution. Um, I think it's pretty, I think, I, like, I think the World Bank's statistics about, even if, you, even if they did lift millions of people out of poverty by their own uh, accounting, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't line up with the fact that we still have billions of people who are in poverty. I mean, it, uh, the ethical poverty line so the world, so so I guess I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but the world, uh, the World Bank poverty line is around a dollar a day, um, and they've shifted those numbers around a little bit over time. But um, have you heard of the ethical poverty line? Is nope. that something you're familiar with? Um, I'm gonna guess that you probably set the wage at some higher number to show that not as many people are lifted out of poverty. Yeah, so it's about five dollars a day is the ethical poverty line, um, and uh, so sixty percent of the people on the world make less than five dollars a day. What was it at, um, like, 20 or 30 years ago? Do you know? Yeah, I've got the numbers, actually. It's... Let me find this real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, it's loading up. So, in 1990... Okay, so it's 1 billion more people uh, under $5 a day since 1990. There's 1 billion study. more people? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that could be because of population, but... Yeah, because I was going to say, like... It's, it conflicts with the World Bank's numbers, is the... Is the well, that's because it sounds like it's measuring something different, right? If you're setting it at $5 a day versus $1 a day, then, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, but, I mean, do you see it... Do you... Do you I, I guess I'm just asking, do you honestly think that uh, capitalism is lifting people out of poverty around the world? I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I think, like, liberalization of trade has definitely helped a lot of countries. I think that um, we have greater access to things like luxury goods and, and whatnot, at least in Western countries. Um, obviously, um, places in South, Amer uh, South America or Africa have been pretty fucked by imperialist countries that have been doing a lot of bad activities, and those countries are kind of sort of catching up. But, I mean, capitalism isn't perfect. We can point to the idea that there's still a lot of problems, which is absolutely true. Um, mm -hmm. But, I mean, like, if we go by track records, I don't really think socialism or communism ha has a seat at the table in this conversation. So I don't know if it's fair to, like, point at some of the problems of capitalism, which there are absolutely problems today for sure. But but to ignore, like, all of the good that we we've come this far with and then say, like, you know, this is bad because there are still problems that exist, I don't think that's a, a fair critique. Well, I, yeah, I, I would also say that it's not really fair to say that, um, I mean, for instance, if you look at the fact that uh, y you brought up imperialism, I mean, um, and, you t and you talk about capitalist markets and the way that they distribute money, I mean, uh, you use the word yourself. I mean, you, you have to recognize that imperialism is a pretty predominant feature of world capitalism, and there is absolutely uh, a lot of wealth being siphoned up from poor countries and a lot of exploitation going on in those poor countries. I mean, how would you account for that in a capitalist system? I mean, how would you, how would you, avoid I mean, that? I don't know if imperialism necessarily has to be baked into capitalism and I'm pretty sure socialist countries and communist countries in the past have been pretty imperialistic as well. So I, I don't know yeah. if it's like a, I mean, this is like a government policy question. I mean, we can argue things like the uh, industrial military complex highly incentivizes these forms of foreign affairs, which I would agree with. And I think that these are things that definitely should be changed. Um, our, our foreign policy is pretty mm -hmm. disgusting. And the idea that there are people that get rich off of it is pretty disgusting as well. So, I mean, this would be an idea or this would be an example of some, some economic reality that probably should be curbed by some kind of government regulation how would you how would you change it though like this is i guess where i see a, a huge mm -hmm. uh i guess disconnect because like how, if the people who have the most power and the most wealth are the ones that are benefiting off of the system and they have the most power to influence the system like how do you see change being affected within this within these capitalist systems? Um, I mean, honestly, it's really hard, but I don't, I don't think imperialism is a feature of capitalism. I, I, I like the, my, my real, my real, <laughs> if I'm being super real, the answer is I don't think these things ever change because people are just stupid. Um, I mean, imperialism has been a feature of the world since the dawn of mankind. I mean, pre, pre feudal societies, pre feudal societies, like Rome, like all of these places have been highly imperialistic. The idea that like imperialism is some new thing that, you know, showed up on the planet, you know, post capitalism is absolutely not true. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how you stop people from being imperialistic from thing in their country is exceptional compared to others that they want to install governments in other places they want to kill other people like I, I don't know what the answer to that is but i don't think it's some economic system well so okay that, that so that's let's that brings us back to anarchism because anarchism is not like i was saying earlier mm -hmm. anarchism leads me to communism um so maybe we can just explore that a little bit like uh you talked about hierarchies um mm -hmm. so so the whole idea of anarchism basically is dismantling hierarchies that are unjust as much as possible or disma basically dismantling all hierarchies as much as possible um so that everyone is basically on a more flatly hierarchical plane so so it's sort of a way it, and it's also a 
method of analysis. I would say anarchism is more of a method of, of analyzing societies and analyzing economies, analyzing social groups mm -hmm. and um, trying to make them more fair, more just. Um, and and the way that capitalism is structured, I mean, we can go, like I'm, I'm actually a former capitalist myself. So I I used to own several businesses for about 10 years. I had about 15 employees who I exploited and, um, you know, made profits off of. And I guess so. Do you think that 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 the way like a corporation or even a small business is structured, do you think that that's like a just way of organizing a workforce or organizing anything? I mean, the way that we do that under capitalism. Um, so I'd say no. But before we get into um, whether or not that's specifically unjust, I'm very curious um, to, to push yeah. on this uh, hierarchy thing real quick, because I, I just I actually haven't yeah. had this conversation before. Do you believe that sure. all hierarchies are unjust by definition or can there be just hierarchies? There are, I would say, justifiable hierarchies. So, for instance, I would say that a parent, you know, with a small child mm -hmm. would have the authority to, for instance, stop them from running into the street okay. or, you know, ensure their well-being. That's like a very basic example. Another example might be like if you're on a ship at sea and there's a storm, you would probably want to have some kind of hierarchy uh, in place so that communication can be efficient and so that, like, there's not a lot of, like, confusion going on. Mm -hmm. You might want to have a hierarchy where there's like a captain and then there's like the crews that all have their own stations mm -hmm. in those situations. That I would say is a justifiable hierarchy because it's like incredibly pragmatic and probably dangerous to not have that hierarchy versus like at a coffee shop. Um, I really don't see any reason for there to be like a top level store manager at a coffee shop. The stakes aren't really that high to where there's a lot of life and death situations going on. Um, I don't know if that kind of made it more clear to you where I'm coming from? Sure, so a couple questions. So um, yeah. um, I don't know what kind of system you're advocating for, but in most systems of like socialism or communism that I'm familiar with, you still have like managers. They're just voted on by the people, right? Well, so, so we want to reduce the, so for instance, there, there are, anarchism is a, is a way of like, again, analyzing and viewing things, and it's a work in progress. So, so something that Rudolf Rocker, who was a famous anarchist a long time ago, said was, um, I am not an anarchist because the end goal is anarchism. I'm an anarchist because there is no end goal, right? So one heavy feature of anarchist thought and principle is that we should constantly be analyzing our systems and trying to improve them and trying to make hierarchies as flat as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, I mean, for instance, let's say you had like a factory um, you, you might organize it so that the voters work, the, the workers vote for a manager. Mm -hmm. Um, but anarchists would look at that system and we'd say, okay, so if the, if the workers are voting for a manager that we don't want to have a system where that manager then has coercive power and domination over the workers. So what can we do to make that system as fair as possible? There are many ways we could experiment to try to make it as flat as possible. So for instance, maybe instead of voting on the manager, you rotate a manager in, or maybe there is like a council of people instead of one manager who like decide things together like a triumvirate or whatever. But you know, wouldn't it's, those it's council not of people it, have oppressive power too, though? They could, they could, and that's the whole point of anarchism is to identify situations where people have coercive authority and power and dismantle them as much as we possibly can. Wait, and so if, the council and, and of so, people that you made to evaluate the effectiveness of a manager that you have voted in to flatten a hierarchy. Are themselves subject to the same hierarchy? Uh, how does that work? Uh, it it would it would depend very much on the specific factory and the specific group of people and how they decide to organize themselves. I mean, um, I sure, don't. Have let's a just think of like. So I'm just kind of curious. So we can just like um, have like a little hypothetical factory that's running. Um, how how okay. would you like? How would you make a decision on whether or not you should fire somebody for a factory? You would honestly, you'd obviously, you'd have to do the same thing that uh, it would be the same situation as in a hierarchy where you'd have to look at the situation and you'd have to make decisions. But the, but the difference between a capitalist hierarchy uh -huh. and a, um, you know, an anarchist system is that in the hierarchy, the, the strict hierarchy, the corporate kind of hierarchy, there's one person, they look at this situation, they make a decision and then it 
like the power flows down. Uh -huh. Whereas anarchists would try to organize things from the bottom up. So it's as democratic as possible. Sure. So let's so say we have you, a factory where... If you wanted to fire where, somebody... Yeah. So let's say yeah. we have a factory where 30% of... We've got a factory. 30 of our workers here are women and 70 of our workers are men. Let's say that a man was okay. accused of sexually harassing a woman, but all the men were like pretty chill with the guy and think that people are taking this too seriously. In a situation like mm -hmm. this, is it better to leave this up to the democratic voice of the workers or should there be some higher form of management that can be oppressive towards the workers' democratic will? Do you, I mean, that seems like a, uh, the worst possible example to use because in a capitalist system, you would just have like the guy at the top make the decision and that would be the end of it. But in this it's just system, okay, so let me give you a great well, example. So wait, of how well, well, real quick, real quick. In a capitalist system, yeah. this company could be subject to outside pressure. They might lose money. They might get bad press. The firm might become less uh, profitable. And if a firm is, th is going to lose profits, then there would be pressure from the top down to enact policies that would hopefully keep them out of the public ire. So that's why I think in a capitalist firm, this is dealt with in this way, just because of where we're at socially right now, maybe in the past this wasn't true. Well, if you, hold on, if you look at like an airport, uh -huh. uh, I can't really, you can look at, you can look at, there's an, there's a specific airline that had, uh, uh, NPR did, I wish I could remember the name of this place, but there, there was a specific airline that had a lot of issues of, with sexual harassment and their whole strategy was just to basically pay hush money, shut it up and never acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they did that was for the profit motive. They didn't want to get the bad press and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So it, they, they, they never solved the problem. And this happens, obviously, in lots of corporations. They never solve the problems. They just try to make it invisible to the public eye because all they're concerned about is the profit motive. Versus if you have a – let me – so I'm going to go back to that example I was about to do. So in, uh, in, in northern Syria, which is uh, famously called Rojava – it's not a perfect example of anarchism, but they have some really good systems in place. And one of those, is, we have something called a dual power structure. So that means, or a secondary power structure. So that means that they have a council for the, for the community, like a commune council, and they make all these decisions. But they had problems with their culture where women were like, you know, obviously uh, subjugated, you know, culturally. And the, the women realized this, and some of the male real leaders realized this. So what they did was they created like a women's council that was kind of like, a sidecar to the main council. And there was a council where it was just the women and they would come together and they would discuss things and they would, you know, have that strength in numbers so that they could then go into the normal council and have a stronger voice and a united voice. And that has worked out really well for them and given women a much more significant voice within those communities. So in, in this factory situation, I would say if you have 30% women, uh, they can have a secondary power structure where they can, you know, discuss these things uh, that affect them in, in a negative way and they could have their own little power structure kind of on the side mm -hmm. that can interact with the larger power structure and, you know, hopefully make things more equitable. Yeah, I mean, that sounds cool. So but, always... I mean, people do this today in capitalist societies as well. Um, sometimes you make councils of people that come together and uh, you could have a third party come in and analyze. So I don't know how familiar with video games, but like sometimes people mm -hmm. hire out people like Anita Sarkeesian or whatever to come in and give speeches to a company or to look at a company or companies will evaluate like whether or not there is gender discrimination going on. Like this happens in firms today, like even in a capitalist society. I don't think this is necessarily economics dependent. Right. And so if, if a company is doing that today, then they're using what would be a more on the anarchist side of things principle. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you think that what I advocate for is like everyone grabbing their AK-47s and overthrowing the state and instantly putting together a capitalist society at gunpoint. I mean, an anarchist society at gunpoint. That's mm -hmm. not what I'm advocating for. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm just kind of curious, for... like, which hierarchies you think are justifiable and which hierarchies aren't? Because you, whatever any society we create is, by definition, has to have some level of hierarchies. Um, so I'm just curious, like, how you figure out which ones are good and which ones aren't. And then if some of the arguments you use for the good ones are a little bit too general, then I'm going to steal those arguments. I'm going to apply them to any capitalist hierarchy as well. So earlier you said something about how, like, uh, obviously when it's incredibly pragmatic and dangerous not to have, like, a leader in some cases, well, I mean, I'm going to steal that definition. I'm going to apply it to a lot of capitalism as well. Mm-hmm. Where I would consider like certain things to be very pragmatic, like with a massive company or, or firm, for instance, like we, we probably wouldn't democratically vote on every single issue. When it comes to things like hiring or firing people, it's probably not a good idea to democratically vote on each one of those because you could run into a lot of trouble in that case. Well, so again, it's like you're. I, it's not for me to say how every single system should be implemented and different. And one of the great things about anarchism in my mind is the fact that it's much more flexible in the way that we can organize systems than the than the top-down hierarchy. Well, I mean, you know, so, so not to, I'm not trying to push too hard, but I mean, 
your system is incredibly flexible because you haven't given me any like solid answers to anything. So I mean, of course it's going to be really flexible, well, but like, I feel like it's kind of hard. Cause like when sometimes, when I, cause I'm, I'm actually genuinely curious cause I'm not at the end of the mm-hmm. day, I'm not married to capitalism. If there's a better system then fuck it, fuck capitalism. I don't, I don't have like any dogmatic um, allegiance to the system, but if like every time, you know, like, well, I'm, I am genuinely curious. Like, well, how would you organize a factory? What would you do if the majority of the people there were bigoted? Um, what if the workers voted that they didn't want black people working there? You know, how do you get th- these problems fixed? I'm curious because people always cite like uh like worker run factories as solving all these problems and then it usually gets pushed back into some vague like well different systems do it in different ways and then i'm left to defend like all the messes of the real world implementation of capitalism while you have like the i guess like the blanket of like any form of socialism that works for whatever particular argument we're talking about i think oh yeah no these are all completely fair questions and they're questions that i grappled with so Mm -hmm. i have absolutely know what you're well, like, but we're not even at the hard questions yet. Like, these are like hypothetical. Like, how do you run a factory where you might? Run, this is like a tyranny of the majority question, right? Like, what if sixty percent of your workers hate black people and they only vote on white managers? Like, what do you do there? Yeah, I'm from South Carolina, so uh-huh. I have definitely thought about this. Yeah. Um, like, so you, you can talk about making like a co- like a council of like black people, but like obviously this factory is not going to vote on it. So now you need a third party, like a government or a state, to impose that on them, which is a hierarchy. Like, how do you solve these problems? If you, okay, if there's a group of people in any situation who are being exploited or oppressed, so for instance, like, uh, I'm from South Carolina, like I said, and I understand that if today, if today, like, I could sign with a pen and just say, like, okay, South Carolina is now completely anarchist and everyone votes on everything democratically and it's just, like, open democracy for everything uh, in South Carolina, that could be really shitty for a lot of black people and for a lot of gay people and a lot of trans people. And, um, and uh, the... Um, so, so, so the, the one thing I want to say is that I'm a revolutionary anarchist. So if you feel like you're in an exploited situation, if you're a black person in the deep South, or if you're a trans person in the United States of America, or if you're in an, if you're being imperialized by another country in some place like Cambodia or whatever, um, I think that it is within your, you know, rights and, and it's within your interest to organize your own secondary or dual power structure and fight however you need to, to, be liberated. So if you're in a, if you're in a situation where you're in like, like, let's say we lived, we lived in an anarchist society, but it was a racist anarchist society, which is totally possible. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that wouldn't be a fully anarchist society, obviously, because you would have a hierarchy of like white people over black people or or what have you. Right. So that would not be a, there there would be a hierarchy there. So in that way, it's, that's a contradiction right there. Right. But if you're in that situation where everything's democratic and you don't have capitalism, but there's still this problem of racism, then it's up to, uh, every person who opposes racism to fight against that and overthrow that hierarchy. Yeah, but you're assuming they'll always have the means to do it. If I have a factory with 70 white workers and 30 black workers, the white workers aren't yeah. necessarily being oppressive, like, totally. They just don't want to ever vote on a black manager. And the black people feel like, well, this is some bullshit. Like, our voices are never heard. Like, we feel like we don't get good representation. So you're saying that, like, the next step is vi- literally violent revolution? Like, that's the way to go? Or I didn't. Well, I didn't say violent. Violent is like a... I, I take violence very seriously because I live in Vietnam and I've spoken many times to many veterans of the of the North Vietnamese army who suffered tremendously in the revolution. And I know that the violence, you know, was was a terrible, terrible thing. It's not something I take lightly. Okay. But um, so like, know, what so, would be so their not, recourse? Not, what would they do? Who would they well, if you got to? 30 workers in a, in a factory with 70 workers, then um, obviously they could strike. They could. Uh, there are many ways that they could resist. They could strike. They could have, dem- you, you know, a demonstration. They can form a dual power structure, come up with some kind of proposals for how they can enact their revolution. And if nobody in that factory will listen to them or or reconcile with them, they can either start their own factory or try to overtake the factory. It's it, what I'm saying is it's within their right to try okay, to so liberate themselves. We're saying a and it would also so like, be within one of those was violent. Start your own factory is. I mean, that's a whole other road we can go down, which related to capital. Um, but like mm-hmm. throw, overthrow the factory, that sounds kind of violent to me. It doesn't have to be. I mean, they could just they could just stand in front of, you know, they could have a have a walkout or they could have a sit in or, you know. Or what I, does overtake mean, I guess, or overthrow that? That sounds to me like I'm seizing your property. I'm like, I'm taking it from you. Maybe we're using like different definitions. Or... That's like a last course, but it is on the table. Yeah. If, 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 if you think about it, if, look, if you have a factory and you have 70 workers and 30 of them are black and 40 of them are white, and then all 100% of the white workers want to oppress 
the black workers and refuse to acknowledge their their problems that they're bringing up mm -hmm. through peaceful means, how could you possibly criticize the black workers for doing whatever is within their means to liberate themselves? Well, I'm not criticizing them, but it seems like in your system you're like very subject to like a like a rule of the majority. Like if you've got an overwhelming majority of people, if they're outnumbered two to one, it seems like they just kind of have to take it. They don't really have any recourse, especially if you don't have a state that they can actually seek um you know help from like i don't know who they would well they would have okay so so your the factory doesn't exist in a vacuum first of all okay okay so like in an anarchist society there would be many factories there would be community councils there would be we we, we sometimes call them syndicates so a syndicate is basically uh, a collection of people who work together for their own interests right so mm -hmm. it might be for instance a disability syndicate which is a collection of people who are disabled who fight for their own interests and fight to make sure that their voice is heard, right? What if everybody so decides, what if people look at like the dis the disabled syndicate and everybody's like, yo, mm -hmm. our outputs, our jobs, everything would be so much better if we just didn't work with these guys. Like what what do you do in that case then? And the disabled people are just like, fuck. Like, That's what's happening now under capitalism. I mean, capitalists I mean, disabled people are completely unvalued in capitalism because they don't they don't produce profits for corporations. Except I mean, you if know, you're disabled, some of them do. well, if you're disabled, there are com that's not true at all. There are plenty of companies that ha have hiring incentives for disabled people. Firstly, secondly, um, there are state codes that are enforced by the government that mandate some level of accessibility to buildings um, for disabled people. That's why you see like ramps and everything, and this is true even in like state federal parks. Um, and then you've also got like the fact that you have a legal system that will defend you if somebody is um, discriminating against you for disabled reasons. Like you can take somebody, you can take an employer to, to court for that because I'm pretty sure being disabled is. A protected class yeah but if you talk to disabled people like i do every day you know that they suffer tremendously and they don't feel like they have a voice and they don't feel like they have any uh they, they're not valued by capital society especially if you talk about people who are like completely disabled um yeah know, i mean like, like that's somebody who that, i'm sure yeah, being disabled sucks um, in some cases, it being, even being black in America sucks. I mean, like, yeah, there's a lot of problems yeah. for sure. Um, but there are still avenues of which to address these. It can definitely be improved. Um, I'm just curious. It Why seems do like you think that those wouldn't exist under anarchism? Why do you think there wouldn't be, for instance, a community council? I mean, like the, 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 well, the community every... government okay. under anarchism would mm -hmm. in many ways do the things that you're, that you're praising about a capitalist society. So you would have, for instance, a community council or a council of community councils, and they would have you know they would have their own power base so if you had like a, a a community let's go let's go a little wider and say we have a community and we have like uh more uh you know so it's, it's a diverse community and uh, the other thing just to make it clear like anarchism won't work if people don't sort of you, you have to be kind of culturally turned on to anarchism like you can't just take anarchism and throw it onto a community that has a entrenched capitalist mindset and have that work right just like you couldn't take uh just like for instance just like how capitalism when it enters into socialist countries there's a really tough transition period where these countries like for instance the former soviet union or or wherever um once capitalism goes in there there's like a really rough transition period because people have been culturally trained and educated and socialized into a socialist system and then suddenly capitalism is thrown onto them and there's a rough transition period and i, I would say that's a major reason why you have this huge oligarchy yeah, I, I understand that it's like really union. messy in practice but i mean like both of our economic systems are very messy in practice um but like I'm, I'm just i'm on the hypotheticals i'm just curious like what the ideal way would be to deal with this like if you if i ever ask you a question you feel like it's unfair you can always turn it back at me well how would you deal with it because i have my idealistic ways of, of dealing with it right like as a society we would guarantee like a certain set of rights to people that would hopefully be protected by some founding document oh, yeah. like a yeah. constitution and then it would be Definitely. enforced by like a federal level entity but if you don't have a federal entity to delegate your, your like arbitration to right like well hey we are the co-op of co-ops of all the disabled people and everybody just they don't want to do business with us or build ramps for us because it's not worth it for their you know for their companies they don't want to do it well who do we appeal to there is no government i'm just curious how you ever resolve that situation you have nobody to oh there's arbitrate. A, there is a government there is a government that's what i'm saying there would be a government it would just be a it would be a much more democratic government and there would be more mechanisms for everyone to have their voice heard uh wait so what is it. how are we at okay I, and i could be EJ. totally ignorant of the definitions but how, how are we at how are we an anarchist so my understanding of anarchy and communism is that both of these terms imply no state. An anarchist is generally a person that is against a form of government, and communism is by definition a stateless, currencyless society. How does an anarcho-communist want a state or a government? 
or are these like fundamentally different things or the the the, the again so back to the def the, the anarchist definition of a state is that it specifically protects like one class interest and i would argue that most if not all capitalist states that exist today uh are built and constructed to protect a certain class like for instance the united states of america was founded by uh white male landowners and yes some of that has changed over the years mm -hmm. but it hasn't changed a lot it's still i mean i would say that the united states has significantly changed over the past 250 years Considering we went from a society where women couldn't vote, gay people weren't talked about, trans people didn't exist in any size, shape, or form, and black people were slaves, I think we've changed quite a bit. Well, we still have we still have black people as slaves, like in our for-profit prison institutions, and we still have, uh, you know, and now we have the migrant workers in concentration camps. I mean, I, I would definitely say that the power structures in the United States of America lean; they're built from the ground up to benefit people with a lot of power already. I would say that I don't, I, the fact that we have a problem with privatized prisons that employ black people in a, in a slave-like manner, which I would probably slavery, is a far cry from black people aren't even seen as human in the United States and can only exist here as slaves. Like, again, we absolutely have problems, but we're a far cry from, from the slavery. I mean, I'm not trying to do the racism is fixed, but we had a black president. No, 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 we no. Probably no. Couldn't and I don't want to make president it... in the 1700s or the 1800s. I mean, it's, we're yeah, and quite I don't want to make it that. sound like I think that we have it as bad now as the slave. Obviously, chattel slavery is like a far more brutal system. But I will say this, like capitalism has evolved right uh -huh. since since the slavery system and what they've found or in and i'm not saying this this is like a necessarily a uh something intentional this might have just happened organically but what has happened is capitalism has over time uh kind of transformed itself we would say if you want to use the marxist dialectical it's negated itself from a so for instance it started with the slavery system where it was just like very overt you are a black slave. You do everything that you were told. You know, it's very simple to see what's going on there. And it's very, it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, kind of open oppression. Right. Mm -hmm. And then that transformed afterwards into like the sharecropping Jim Crow system, which was, uh, slightly less oppressive, I guess you could say, but it was also more, a little bit more complicated, right. Mm -hmm. Which made it a little bit more difficult to dismantle. And then that transformed into like the segregation system from, you know, like I'm from South Carolina and a lot about that, that made everything it, you're you know, saying right now complicated. sounds really good. It sounds to me like under the system of capitalism, these systems are getting less and less oppressive. No, it might, it might be, uh, like less violently oppressive, but I mean, I'd say less oppressive still... in any definition of the word. I would argue that living under Jim Crow was shit, but it was less oppressive than slavery. I would argue that living in current American society is shit, but it's less oppressive than Jim Crow or segregation, legalized segregation, like, right? Yeah, so, so this is the thing. Like, like, so a liberal basically would say that, like, we can reform capitalism, we can gradually improve it over time, Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's that like it, that there's always going to be like any time the working class gets close to a revolution in the United States of America, specifically, the capitalist class has been very astute about knowing when to kind of pull back a little bit. So a great example of that would be like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who's said that his greatest achievement as president was saving capitalism. So we had a very strong socialist movement in the 1920s and 30s. They were really we had socialist governors. We had socialist, you know, People and uh, I think we had we had a lot of socialist mayors, maybe some socialist senators, and it was really getting close to like a socialist revolution in the United States of America. So FDR went around, he bought out the top leaders of all the socialist systems, he implemented the New Deal, he gave concessions, you know, in certain areas to prevent the revolution. Yeah, this so sounds like did... this all sounds like a good thing. So, firstly, I don't think America was ever at a point where we we're going to have a socialist revolution. I know that we had socialist parties here um, that had like some people in them, but it was always like a minority of a minority. Like even even in Europe, we don't have like huge socialist or communist parties like today. Like even in Sweden, you don't have like communism taken seriously like as like a widespread political movement. And, and the most popular uh, party over there are the Social Democrats, and these are in some of the most like socialist places or whatever that as Americans we would say are socialist or whatever. Um, I, so, but I mean. I mean, even regardless of that, it sounds to me that like a group of people were making a demand and that the system was flexible enough to cave into these demands and FDR did it. These sound like positive things to me. These sound like positive reforms to me. But then they always get rolled back. They always get rolled back. 
and, and that's and it not maybe not completely, but there's always going to be that control over us. And so, like we're seeing it right now with Trump. And this is the really scary part about it is once capitalism starts to really falter, you know, because ca capitalism is in inherently unstable and it's inherently oppressive. And once capitalism starts to really falter, that's when you see fascism start to creep in. And we're absolutely I, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I would say that under Trump, we're definitely trending more and more towards fascism. Uh, I, I, I saw I don't remember who you were dating with, but you talked about how like, well, now gay people have it better. Now trans people have it better or whatever. That's hanging by a thread. That's a very fragile improvement in their lives and it's being rolled back or on the verge of being rolled back in very material ways and it's not just by law because culturally people and socially people are oppressed as well so like i would say that the environment for gay and trans people currently is definitely getting more hostile and um and, and there's no way for them to the, under this capitalist system unless you have the wealth and the power to to go toe to toe with the capitalist elites how can you really truly have a voice? I mean, it's not, it, the, the power imbalance is so absurdly, you know, imbalanced that, uh, do, do, do you see where I'm going with this? It's not a, it's I mean, it's yeah, I don't disagree that, that there are power imbalances in society right now. I just don't think that the rest of your argument logically follows from it. Also, I don't know how, how we can criticize capitalism for being unstable, but I mean, if you take the 250 year, whatever, existence of the United States and compare it to, like a lot of communist or socialist countries, I don't find a lot of stability there either. I mean, you should know this if you live in Vietnam right now, right? Does this feel like a very stable, safe place to you? Like, yes, it's Vietnam. I love, uh, Vietnam is much more. Yeah, yeah. Wait, this is doesn't where you Vietnam? Need to aren't, aren't, you guys aren't even allowed to have like trade unions there, right? Isn't it a single party? Every state? single business in Vietnam is required to have a union. Uh, okay, I'll have to it's look this up law. because I was under much different understandings. You can look the... it up or I can have Luna come here and talk to you about how every business she's ever worked at has a union because it's required by law. I mean, I've lived here for six years. I know what I, I'm doesn't talking about. Vietnam, with this don't you guys have like a ton of like political prisoners and everything for people that are arrested? Or did, am we I have just... less, We have far fewer people in jail per capita than the United States. Like, look it up. You, you I'm know, not talking like, about like a the, jail the, per capita. That's a, that's a totally different type of thing. I don't, I don't think we... Um... I don't. I, I'm. I'm almost positive that what you're saying is not true. Um, unless everything I read is just capitalist propaganda. Like, it, it, wait, okay. I've, is this, I've, wait, I'm I've curious. Hold on. Are, are you? Is this a, this a single party a state? Right. Like, you're not allowed to have more than any other political party there. Right. It is a single party state. I don't. I'm okay. Not, for I your do, unions, are they allowed to be like the, actual like independent trade unions, or do they all have to be associated with the government? They're not. Associated. Every company has its own union. Now they're not perfect unions, and there's a there's definitely like a lot of corruption, and there's definitely imperfection. But absolutely, every company is required to have a union, and the unions are are controlled by the workers. I mean, it's 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 not a um, and and it, Vietnam it, doesn't lock up like political prisoners or people that blog negatively about the country. None of this happens. This is, everything I'm reading is just totally lies. Or I interviewed for the BBC a, a person who was under house arrest for political dissent. Okay, so yes, it does happen. Just a little uh, bit? It does not happen. Well, look, I'm not a Marxist, Leninist, communist for one thing. Sure, okay? well, hold on, because well, 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 this is like, this is some pretty big, I, I'm just tell me if you agree or disagree with this. The Vietnam General Confederation of Labor is the sole national trade union center in Vietnam. Is this true or is this just it, a lie? That would be like their version of the United States Department of Labor, basically. Okay, every all trade an, unions in Vietnam are required to affiliate to the VGCL, and the VGCL is one of the mass movements of the Vietnamese Fatherland Front. Is that true or? That is, I, I don't know if that's true, but I will tell you that, that it's basically every company has its own individual union that is like autonomous. That all have to be affiliated, they might, autonomous? They might have to or? be affiliated with this. Okay, first of all, uh -huh. I, I want to say this. I don't think that this is the perfect system at all. Okay, well, no, but you came out swinging hard for Vietnam, and my understanding of that government was that there's, like, massive pressure from external forces to not be, like, locking up, like, to, like, the Human Rights Watch, like, writes a lot about Vietnam political prisoners, where people get locked in jail for years. The Human Rights years. Watch is not a good source. What is a good external source, or am I only supposed to trust what the Vietnam government says about Vietnam? Uh, maybe, I don't think you only need to trust what the Vietnamese mm -hmm. government... No, I, I, I'll be the first person to tell you that the Vietnamese government has plenty of corruption and problems, but I am not going to say that they're uh, some kind of like violent police state that oppresses all opposition speech. I, I see people protesting on the streets all the time. Uh, there have been situations where people have had strikes at their work, you know, within the last year. There was a situation where a group of farmers here in Hanoi 
uh, literally kidnapped like 20 police officers. You can look that up. They uh, held them for about three days and they were demanding that they get their land, that they keep their land that was trying to be taken by a telecommunications company. Uh, a Communist Party leader came over and supported them and they ended up winning that whole situation. The police were let go. Nobody went to prison for that. Okay, so, so okay, I mean, I guess I'll look. I'll have to look more because most of the information that I've read usually comes from Human Rights Watch and my understanding of Vietnam. And then based on the other stories I've read, there from bloggers that come from that country, you usually say that like, oh yeah, like if you are if you are like an outspoken critic of the government, especially like after two, after 2017, that you can get like locked in jail or people will like be there to intimidate you or that you can have like these like you'll get detained and you'll have these long waits for like pretrial pretrial stuff where you won't get like. This is Luna Nguyen, who's a Vietnamese. Uh, yeah. YouTuber who makes political content with me yeah. on a daily basis and okay, I have and a, criticizes the yeah. government. Um, and I have to tell you this, 99.9% .9 of the news that you're reading about Vietnam in the Western newspaper and all kinds of media, they are fake, okay? And then just don't trust them because like, and I can give you, I can give you, wait, I can, propaganda. I can give you some exi some specific examples that come up all the time. So for instance, some of the BBC reports on Vietnam, they will often say things like the government owns 100% of the land, which is not yes, true. That's not uh, true at all. They will say that like, re like Christianity is illegal here. I've seen that in BBC yes, articles. That's not true. That's a complete fabrication. You have to be careful about what you trust when you, when, with, from the capitalist exactly. media when they talk about Vietnam. And so, I remember that, yeah, no, no, wait, I want to talk to you about this. When I remember that when you told me that the, there's no evidence of communists, of state communist country in the world and you know why because of capitalism capitalist country in the world fuck all us up i mean it's even if that was true that's not my fault that your economic system is too weak to resist outside pressure if anything that's another argument oh for capitalism God. i well i'm Jeez. sorry like if your countries yes. roll over because they can't defend themselves that sounds like a good argument for my system oh, i'm well, sorry but I are mean, you oh saying that they rolled over <laughs> wouldn't that just defend be themselves against the united oh, states i'm and sorry i'm what, sorry what, 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 wouldn't that we just demonstrate that capitalism weak. had a head start, though? That wouldn't really demonstrate yeah, that. Yeah, they had a head start, of course, because they imperialized Vietnam since the 1800s. Oh, I'm sorry that we were so weak that America so, bomb us to the Stone Age EJ, in the 60s and 70s. EJ, what, I'm sorry, that's what, what would our it take thought when we were too weak? To go back to the political prisoner point real quick, because I, I was just curious. So you're saying that yeah. it's it's hyped up, you know, these uh, like the these sources. What would it take to be a political prisoner in Vietnam then? I'll tell you what I think, and I'll give you my honest opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what, and this is a criticism I have of Vietnam. I think if you, the, the easy thing would be if you said that you wanted to like overthrow the government, which some people have done, and they've gone to jail for that. If you said you wanted to overthrow the state, you would go to jail for that. Of That's, course, and, you would be. In the jail in all countries. Well, what world. you're saying, well, no. That's not that, true. Firstly, that's that not is true. not true because what he's talking about right now in anarcho communist study, I can talk about overthrowing the government of the United States all I want. I will never be sent to jail for that. Not in the United States. Well, um, well don't say never. Don't say never because Trump wants to, for instance, criminalize uh, affiliation with Antifa as like a terrorist organization, which is, you know, Antifa just means being anti fascist. So don't say it could never happen. It, it, I, will, I will grant you that it's not current. I'm not in jail in the USA right now. So. You know, that is that is a, a valid point. So, I mean, like, and, yeah, and I mean, we can talk about like potential things that Trump might do in the future. I would hope that our institutions are strong enough to keep that um, like. Yeah. And I don't want to get too in the weeds. Let me let me let me answer your question. Let me answer. Your yeah. Because you asked a question. It's a fair question. And these are things that I would say are my criticisms of Vietnam. I'm not saying that this like by no means do I think Vietnam is a perfect country at all. OK, so the, the number one reason you would go to jail is if you actively said, I want to overthrow the Communist Party of Vietnam. The second reason would be if you like specifically went on the attack after like one individual person, you know, that's like very high ranking, that would probably get you in some kind of hot water. Okay. And I don't think those are good things. Okay. That, that, that's what tends to get people locked up here. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking out generally against the government or protesting against corporate activity or protesting against things that the government are doing is absolutely open to free speech. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that Vietnam has a perfect system. The United States government also does not have a perfect and we have political prisoners in the United States. Maybe not. I, I would say we. Wait, probably, what do you mean by I, political I, I, prisoners in the United States? I mean, like you could go back to the Black Panthers, where we had. Well, no, no. Uh, let's not know, go back. Let's we like have, we're talking well, about on. today. Like, we don't just have political prisoners. Okay, we have assassinated political dissenters. The CIA and the, the FBI, and that's that's not even a conspiracy theory. If you look at Fred Hampton, was specifically shot in his bed. Asleep. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I, the United okay, States so done a lot of horrible. Don't act like the United States. I'm not going to say that, but like today, yeah. right now, I don't think we typically like throw somebody in jail for being like a political dissenter. Um, say no, for we could argue him. that the United States is bad on whistleblowers. Yeah. So. <laughs> 
if if we had a Fred Hampton today who came up and and was an as accomplished of an organizer and an influencer as Fred Hampton was and was trying to organize a, a new Black Panther Party with the same effectiveness that he did, I have no doubt there's not not enough has changed to for me to believe that they wouldn't assassinate of Fred Hampton today the way that they did back then. Okay, I mean, we've had and the we Black have, Panthers and we've had Antifa and you haven't seen like CIA going and like assassinating people that speak out for these groups, but I mean, maybe- We have cops that go in and impregnate members of uh, anti-fascist organizations as undercover cops and like have relationships with them for two or three years and then try to get them locked up. We have cops that go in- Yeah, but I don't think and, that these, okay, so firstly, that sounds, I, I'm not even gonna grant you that. I would really like to see a story on that. Um, but like, it doesn't surprise me. So like things like false agitators and shit that individual cop organizations can do fucked up things, but that doesn't really speak to the overall structure or the overall um, like institutions that exist in the United States. So like, I'm really curious. So like, just cause I've read like so much about like these random people, cause I had to for my TV PP research. So, are you familiar with? Um, and I'm going to butcher the the, um, the the pronunciation here. But Tran um, Hoon Dui Thuk Thuk. Why this guy is in jail for 16 years because he wants a, a democracy and a multi-party uh, political system in Vietnam? What did he really do that like puts him in jail for 16 years? Like. Apparently, I'm he not founded defending three... Vietnam. He, he probably said he wants to overthrow the Communist Party, and he probably should not be in jail. Okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna defend something that I think is wrong. Okay. I don't know that specific story. I don't know the situation. Sure. Okay. We We've got Go Hao. Your maybe your, maybe the, I don't know if that's your wife or girlfriend. I didn't hear what you said, or just a friend, or it's my comrade. Your comrade. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we've got um, Go Hao, maybe. Uh, how I don't know how to pronounce his name. This guy is serving a 15-year sentence for writing articles calling for democracy. Is that? Why are we talking about this? This is not what I'm advocating for. Well, I understand, I but you came out good. swinging real hard this. saying that the Vietnamese government is absolutely nowhere well, near as you said that current. there are no unions, and they have unions. That's where I came I said, swinging No, no, hard. no. You're not allowed to form independent trade unions. That was one of the stipulations that the TPP would have placed on Vietnam for labor reasons, is that you have to have, like, individual representatives of, like, your different trade unions. It can't just be ran all awesome. by the government. What? Yeah, I think that would be good. I think yeah, I but would it's love not. It's the, banned by, the, your, the, by your government, and it sounds like if you try to advocate for one, you're going to These are all reasons why I'm not a Marxist Leninist. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I know I mean, that. I know that you're showing the evidence that to show that our government is not good. Yeah, I, I admit, I never say to you that Vietnamese government is perfect. I never say to you that oh, it's good enough. I think that we can be better. But I mean, I mean, the government is still the hierarchy, and the higher hierarchy will mostly will always lead to the unjust one, and then. I know that's a true everywhere in the world when you anti like and that's the bad thing about Vietnam and um, it's not perfect. Come on. Yeah, no, but I, don't. I I I want you no, I want you to look at the the fact and talk to a real Vietnamese p person that live in Vietnam because you also should not just the Vietnamese living in the outside in the the other countries that got all the kind of brainwashed by the anti-communist propaganda especially from the USA, like we are not bad, as bad as you believe or as the US propaganda is talking to us. You need to look at the fact. You cannot just say that, oh, so you cannot say that, oh, communism is bad because look at Vietnam's enemies government now. No, it's not. One well, no, I, I, I'm not saying all commun. I mean, we can look at like a number of communist governments that have failed miserably <laughs> to point to why communism is bad. Yes, uh, because but let me tell you this. Let listen to me. I will tell you a little bit about the history. Okay. Why all the communism country in the world fucked up like this? First, in the 1945, we had our first revolution, and the, uh, and right after that, France jumped to us. Right after that, American jumped to us and bombed us to Stone Age, and then China do it, and then. In the in the from the eighties in the eighties we had ten years a real communist country in the world. My mom living in that time in that society when the whole village talk just talking about her village only, uh, gather together work together they we all poor but we all poor the same and we share everything we have, and she said that, that was the best time that she had in her life. But in the 1991, when I was born, USSR collapsed. The reason why you all know, right? The USSR collapsed and then we lost our real, the only one ally in the world because the whole world turned our back on us. Only the USSR turned back us and they help us a lot. 
Like we were so poor, we lack of everything. We don't have any resources because you or the capitalist country in the world destroy them all. Okay. And in the 1991, we we were left alone in the world. And then the whole world, even the mostly the World Bank, they forced us to let the capitalism in or else they will leave us alone and then we would die by poverty. And that's how we were fucked up because of you. If the whole world just decide to to help us or to just work with us, not we 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 don't require any great great the help or something, just work with us. Just trade with us. It would be f- like Vietnam would continue would uh, Vietnam can continue the the communist society until now. But no, you didn't let me do that because we were the best evidence to prove the world that communism will work well. And you don't let us do that. You fostered if you want like if you want to play our games, you have to follow our rule. And then and from the nineties to the to early two thousand we have the kind of the Doimo reforms. That's the time we try to combine the communism and capitalism together. We had to let the capitalism in to ruin our country, but we still try our best to keep the socialism, the communism in our country to help people. That's why we have, I, I, I am proud to tell you that, to tell you this, we have the best price control in the world. Nobody, no country in the world can do this like us. Like we have to, we have rice control in rice. Rice always so cheap that even the homeless people can have it, can buy it. We had a swine flu. Uh, there's a swine disease. Yeah, every wait, wait, wait. Asia. Your mic is cutting it's out. Pretty... Sorry. Yeah, you're, EJ, your mic's cutting out. So go ahead and t- try talking now. Check, check one. Yep. You're good. Okay. okay. You sound good. Okay. All right. Continue. So we had a we had a, a there was a swine disease recently in Southeast Asia and like Cambodia and all these other countries in Southeast Asia were affected Taiwan, really. Taiwan, Cambodia, yeah, all kinds of countries. The, kind of the the pork price go really high up. But, like, but Vietnam has uh, price controls they put in, and which they have price controls on a lot of things like permanent price controls. But this was like an emergency price control. They put that in. And so, like, we didn't even notice it happening. We yeah. had to see it on the news that all these other countries were suffering because of that. We I had mean, to kill millions of, pork, of pigs all over the country, but the pig price, the pork price still stays the same. And the government will import the pork from the other country, and then they will pay the price gap. They will use the tax. I, I've been here. Great, I just want to say like this. a great example for... of a price control working, but, I mean, I can point to Venezuela for price controls absolutely failing. I mean... I don't know what I'm yes, supposed to. Yes, because the capitalism Venezuela's control is 80% capitalist owned economy, so yes. it's not the same thing. But the um so so well, okay, I, it was a country that tried price controls and they the price controls were too stringent and it wasn't possible to produce yeah, anything any, at that level and they left. Can, I mean, any I mean, kind of uh <laughs> macroeconomic policy can like fail or succeed depending on how it's implemented, of course. Oh, I agree. But, listen, but, you, I but say, yeah, of course. I, you I guess have to look would at you be against using it? Would you be against you price controls in general, Dustin? Yeah, pri- I think price controls in general are horrible. Unless there's some type of externality that's preventing you from like um, settling on like a good market condition for a, a society. I have been. So, see? What yeah. would an externality look like? Um, I want to an ex- tell you this. So like an, an externality might be like um, like maybe there is like an ultra inelastic demand for a certain type of good. So there are some types of medicine, for instance, that are that need to be consumed, like insulin. Um, if these types of things are unaffordable by what people, about food, food needs to be consumed. Yeah, but it seems like for the most part, and I'm the, not saying that glibly because I'll say this. Sure. So in the, nobody, well, well, we don't need price controls in the West for food because it seems like for the most part, most people are eating in the West. Oh, oh my God! No, no, no! You come to rural South Carolina, and you talk yeah. to some of the elder, elderly people or some of the black folks there. I've been in Vietnam for six years. I've been all over this country. I've been in the rural, deep, deep parts of the rural countryside where very few foreigners ever go. I have never seen poverty in this country that approaches. And I'm sure that there might be some somewhere, but that, this is great, close, but like, like the scale 80%, of what I see in South Carolina. I think eighty percent of Americans are overweight. The idea that it's our food is too expensive. They're is malnourished clearly... because they they live in That's food disease. deserts and all they can eat That's are the hamburgers. Sure. So and this, yeah. So when you start talking about they are wealthy enough. Sure. That's the disease. When the over the, the capitalism overthrows everything and they put KFC and all kind of hamburgers <laughs> everywhere, it's fucking expensive, and that's the only thing you can have, and that make you that costs you the disease, and the healthcare system is not cheap enough for you to treat them all, and that's the problem. You're fat not because of you're rich. Come on, you're fat because that's the disease. And that's the only thing we have. Vietnamese people, how would price controls, everywhere. How, how would a price control help you with a food desert? 
I agree that food deserts are a problem and that poor people don't have access to high nutrition content food, but I don't know why you think a, a, a price control would fix that problem. So What's the a food desert, problem? a food desert. One of the main features of a food desert is that there are places to buy food, but there are places like Seven Eleven or McDonald's, and so the healthy, nutritious, wholesome food is either unavailable completely or way too expensive. Like if you want to go buy an apple at a 7-Eleven. I, 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 I understand this. I understand what a food desert is. I'm asking you to tell me how a price control would help you with a food desert. If, yeah. if you can't charge more than like whatever, arbitrary number, 25 cents for an apple or whatever, then 7-Eleven can't charge a dollar or two for an apple. And uh, and it's not just a matter of price controls. It's also a matter of availability, Here's obviously. Here's the, the, the example of food desert, babe. Um, like uh, here now in, in some provinces in Vietnam, we have a kind of the dry, the drought season, like they cannot grow rice because of there's no rain. And you know what our government, what did our government do? The, lo the government will send the rice to the local government and sell it there. So really cheap rice, less than like, like 50 cents for one kilogram of rice. And one kilogram is street load of rice. The whole family can eat for a whole, a whole week. So I mean, I'm pretty like, sure that if so you set like, I'm pretty sure if you just set these price controls in some of these markets, then they would just stop selling those particular products. Like if they can't make any money off of it, they just wouldn't sell it. That's, that's well, wouldn't that be a like... major problem with capitalism. You're correct. Yes. yes. <laughs> that's I, a big so, problem with capitalism. I mean, Destiny, and there are huge <laughs> problems with yeah. state planning. I, I mean, <laughs> we, I mean, you can laugh about it, but you don't have countries to point to that are successful capitalist ones like yeah. I do. Vietnam. Like, so, Vietnam if Vietnam is your go-to country, country, and I can point to Germany, no, France, not. Italy, the United States, Canada, Sweden. Like, I mean, w this is not like... Destiny, how would you yeah. solve the problem? So, you know, there's, there's, there's obviously a problem that when you go out to get food, you can mm -hmm. get a cheeseburger for a dollar, but a salad's like five bucks. So how would you solve that problem under capitalism without the price control? <clears throat> um, oh, it's it. Um, be careful. You cannot solve the problem. Wait, wait, you meant overthrow okay, America, okay. right? I don't want you to just be careful because if you say overthrow, I don't want the cops to show up at your house and arrest you or something like those other 150 people that apparently don't exist in your yeah, prisons. I'm, okay, right, so right, be real right, careful with what you say there. The, all right. So in terms of like, ahead, in terms of like fixing like food problems in the United States, that's a really complicated question. It seems like right now it's really easy to produce low nutrient, high calorie, like high carb, high sugar food. Personally, I'm a big fan of like a type of sugar tax. I think that we should be incentivizing companies to make healthier food. I don't know what that would look like. I think, is the, is the United Kingdom, I think, trying a sugar tax? I don't know if, if they actually implemented that or not, but I've heard talks of it. But um, yeah, like obesity and, and these and the lack so of So that's access. just gonna make the food that's available more expensive though. I mean, it's not yeah, gonna or make maybe it'll Yeah, or maybe it'll incentivize the, the productions of different types of food, or maybe it'll- This whole trying to, like, like you're trying to racketeer the market and like, it's like you're saying, okay, the market is great. It's very have to manipulate it a whole hell of a lot. Yep. It's like, why not just give people food? If they're hungry, why not just give them food? Because why this, just this fantasy world where we can have maximum production to give everybody houses, food, clothing, it doesn't exist. It's not possible. Six times more empty houses in the United States than there are homeless people. We throw away. Wait, how, how do those two numbers connect at all? What does that have to do with anything at all? Why should anybody be homeless when we have empty houses? Six, we have, everyone could have six houses. I don't houses know what an empty homeless. house has to do with a homeless person. Are you going to steal those houses from people that own them? Or what? what's the. Yes. Okay, why not? I mean, I'm not. It's strange why, that why, as an anarcho communist, you're telling me that the state needs to when seize property from house. people. I don't understand. Um, like, why, what, do you, why do you. Uh, you said it's a fantasy land. So why would you say that uh, it, it's impossible to just distribute resources like that? Uh, because I, I doesn't, it doesn't seem to be that, that markets can't just be centrally planned. For, well, I mean, like. Uh, I'm not this talking is, about central planning. I'm uh, saying. I'm saying, so I'm an answer. It's okay, frustrating so because please, like you can, can I, tell me, you can tell, you're basically telling me like in a storybook, like, oh yeah, people will vote themselves less hours. Right. They won't work as much. We'll have more I, resources. I Everything will be efficiently track. allocated without any type of, and like, how am I supposed to argue with that? This is pure delusion. Let's it's fantasy. It, wait, this will let's never put, work. Let's put us back on track. Hold on. Go ahead, I, 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 let's, piv let's pivot away. Let's pivot away from Vietnam. Okay. I don't, I don't really want to talk about Vietnam anymore because yeah, I wouldn't I if I were you either, but yeah, we can pivot away from Vietnam. Because look, all right. My point is Okay. Yeah. I'm not, the reason I want to pivot away from Vietnam is because as much as I admire many of the social systems that are in place here, they're not an anarcho-communist government. So I feel like I've kind of gotten painted into this corner where yeah, I'm no, no, that's fine. Yeah, we don't have to talk about Vietnam. That I, I, just, I just, it, I didn't understand the defense, but we don't have to go into Vietnam. That's fine. Go, yeah, go back okay. to the, yeah. So I want to go back to the U.S. So like, okay, there's this idea, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if anybody's talked about this before or not, but there's this idea, and you might agree or disagree, you might have, but the idea is that scarcity is basically a capitalist myth, Okay. 
And that, and you could look at, there are a lot of different sources of evidence for that. Some, like for instance, even Benjamin Franklin, like two, 200 years ago or whatever, said that uh, a lot of people who have done these studies, you can look them up, have said that like, really, we could all have all of our material needs met. Benjamin Franklin said like four or five hours per day, four or five hours per day, five days a week. Um, and a lot of people, Kropotkin did an analysis in the, at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, I, I don't have the name in my head, but you could look this stuff up. Like what, what kind of uh, work actually has we put in in society for everyone to have food, shelter, clothing, the basic needs of life? And throughout the last 200 years, almost every study I've seen, every study I've seen, and I would welcome any dissenting studies, but they say that like if everyone worked about four or five hours per day, we would definitely, with especially with all of the industrial and agricultural and technological marvels we have in terms of production, it, it's absolutely unnecessary for people to be working eight, nine, ten hours per day, sixty-hour weeks. That like the way a lot of people do in America are working two or three jobs. And you know, you could also look at the book about uh, the book bullshit jobs. It goes into this in great detail about how so much of the labor that is being done under capitalism is just completely useless. And it's a waste of human life and potential and energy. When you okay, say so produce... much of the labor, I'm just just to get a ballpark percentage of that. What do you think? Like half the jobs in this country are worthless, or like five to ten percent are worthless? I'm just you know I'm, I'm not pushing an exact. I'm just curious what you mean when you say yeah, that. Yeah, no. Well, I would say half. I would say half because if, because currently we're we're the average workday is probably around eight hours, give or take. Per, Wait, so half the jobs or day? half the hours worked? Half the labor. Let's say half the labor. Okay. Okay. Um, you understand that this distribution I don't know the can't jobs, be even, I mean. right? Like if I was working retail. No. I can I can't work four hours a day. That has to be like you have to have somebody there. They can't no, get their work no, done. No, 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 no. It's not a. I don't want to be like like an arbitrary kind of absolute. No, I'm saying, broadly speaking, capitalism is very inefficient in the in the sense that we have a bounty of surplus in a developed nation, in terms of what we produce. We could have a boundless boundless surplus of of product in developing countries if only they were given access to own their own means of production. The workers I'm talking about, right? So I, I, and I do I do not think that this point is as easily dismissible as you say it is that we have six empty houses for every homeless person and we throw away however many tons of food every day. That means that we have a huge surplus. We do not have the scarcity that capitalism wants you to believe it has. Capitalism capitalists make a lot of money by manipulating supply and demand. Right. I, I worked in marketing for 10 years. I had an ad agency. You, My job was to manipulate. You even burn the crops to keep the price. That's true. And, and there you are burn farmers. the crops. That's a criminal in Vietnam. There are farmers that burn crops so that they can manipulate the price. And the, and the government That's even. That's criminal. And I would rather give, give, give it for free to poor people. How do you give it for free, though? Crops. Somebody has to transport it there. Somebody has to harvest it. Somebody has to manufacture it into like some type of food product. Somebody has to like this all takes stuff. I'm not saying it shouldn't happen, but like this is going to require some level of government organization to get this done. I don't disagree that. No, the fact you that, don't. Well, hold on. You you do need government organization. It just it could be self-governed, but you do. Need, you know, you, of course, you. What look, does self-govern mean? Is somebody those... going to walk onto somebody's fields and like steal their crops and just go like start a company you that doesn't have like, any. That's how we work yeah, now. EJ, go ahead and address that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so, okay, if uh, if if a person, if if it, it should be criminal, in my opinion, it should not be permitted, not necessarily to say that someone needs to like get locked up in prison for this, but it should not be permitted for a person to have or you know an entity that's profiting off of having shit that people need to live Why? and restricting it from them. What is your justification for, for instance, because if Nestle, they didn't have the rights to make money buying, off it, they just wouldn't all produce the it. groundwater in a developing nation and then selling it back to people in bottled water. Like, why is that? You don't have to buy bottled water. If you buy bottled water in America, you're a dumbass. You can drink water anywhere. I am talking about a developing country. Like, Nestle will go oh. in and they. Wait, out hold of on. The your, mic, your microphone cut off. I'm yeah, sorry. Your mic cut out. So, can you I don't know why that's easier. Easier. Yeah, okay. So, Nestle has a practice of going into a developing nation, mm -hmm. taking the groundwater with a pump in a big factory and taking the groundwater out of the ground so that and, and even in like drought circumstances and then selling the water back to the people yeah that sounds really okay, fucked that's up. A, that doesn't sound like a capitalism that, that just sounds that's, like a super why fucked is up that thing. okay what is different so so i say that it sounds fucked up but then if i say uh you know aldi has a grocery store full of freaking groceries and there's a homeless guy right outside starving What's the difference? Because they don't have They're an obligation to give away their things to other people. That's not how we expect firms Where did to they get what, what, what gave them the license to own the things that they have? That's a bit, let's go it's back to that. It's just how our society is organized. What do you mean? What gave them the license? They probably bought it. They probably paid money for it. As a former capitalist myself, as somebody who, who owned a business, okay, I had complete autocratic control over my company. 
Sure, okay, you should. I You're the owner. Employees. Why wouldn't you? Why? Because you own the company. It's your to company. What do you mean? What, what gave? How did I get? How did I come to own the business? I imagine you invested some initial capital. You probably got some number of employees to work it for you, and you probably made decisions that ended up profiting your company. Right. I had more money than they did. At the start, yeah, of point. course, because you're the money. business owner. Why would they have more money than you? <laughs> why they wouldn't work for you? No, then. I'm it saying when the... I started the company, when I start, okay, why don't they start? Their... Okay, I'll tell you why they don't start their own company. Because uh, let's look at the United States numbers here. Okay, you can look. You can look. Anybody who wants to can look these up. I'm, I'm very confident in these numbers. The average worker makes around thirty thousand dollars per year. Okay, okay? they have about thousand dollars, one thousand dollars, you know, in their bank account, like to their name in cash. They have about six thousand dollars in credit card debt. Um, and, uh, and the average startup business, oh, they also live paycheck to, ch to paycheck and the average startup cost for a small business is about $30,000, which happens to be how much a worker makes in a year. And, uh, the main reason that businesses fail is because of undercapitalization. And that is, you know, you, you have to have a lot of capital startup money to get a business going. So it is not just an option for anyone to go out and start their own business. Yeah, for sure. I agree. All. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, you think that's okay? So you think that I had autocratic, I had a, a justifiable autocratic control over the lives of, of the work lives of 15 people. And yeah, you sure. You're the one that initially invested democracy. the capital. If you want to talk about like, do you think that like income inequality like isn't good or that more people need more money? Like these are things I agree with. But when you're going to sit here and ask me, do you think that I, as the sole owner of a business that is fully liable for everything that this business does and for all the losses of profits or the actual well, loss I capital? Limit, I had a limited liability company, which meant that I'm not going to lose anything more than what's in the company bank account. Yeah, but I you mean, have to invest money into yeah, that bank in order for it to work. Yeah. Okay. Look. It's your capital at the end of the day, so I would expect you to be uh, the owner of it. Of course, why would anybody else own that if it's your capital initially? What, what gives somebody else the right to your capital? So if there's a like, let's if we're on an island and there's ten people and one person has, and we have a little financial economy, right? And one person has literally all the money, mm -hmm. then he's the boss of the island. He's the king of the island. I mean, I would say he has a right to like decide how he wants this shit to be ran. Now, if we want to talk about like we want to redistribute the money to other people through the form of taxes or something, I'm 100% okay with that. I don't think it's right that one guy has all the money, but I wouldn't expect him to operate a firm where he would just give it all away. That doesn't make any sense or where he would give other people owner. That's just not how firms operate Why in any understanding of the word. You're, so, so because that's the way we're doing things now, that's the way it has to be. It sounds like that's what you're saying. The, the problem is we're conflating yeah. all sorts of moral arguments with our economic organization. Like when, when you tell me like, a ca did you know that a capital owner that has 100% equity in a business is the one that's getting all the profits from the business? Well, yeah, that's like, that's a tautology. Like that definitionally follows, of course. Now, if you want to say like- Why do you like, think we should have democracy in wait, 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 our state? But there's a different question when you're like, if laborers are poor, oh, well, that's a problem. Then we need to address that either with negative tax rates, either with higher minimum wage, either with some other form of distribution, redistribution from wealthy people. But, the, but these two questions, are like fundamentally disconnected from one another. I don't see like some You're moral framing, statement. The way, okay, so capitalism frames things in this really kind of, and I'm not being dishonest, but I think that capitalism has a dishonest way of framing things because they frame it like, okay, there's a limited amount of resources and the people who have the resources, they, they run the show and, uh, and that's just the way it is because there's not enough to go around. We have to compete and fight for it all. But the, the objective reality is that there is enough food clothing, shelter, enough of the material needs for life for everyone to be secure. Sure. So right. for, well, this is, we, we just jumped arguments completely. Like, are you talking about... All right, like, I didn't mean to. Well, so well, my no, point no, wait, is... Wait, wait, wait. Because well, like, do we want okay, to talk okay, about whether ahead, or not the sole owner that has 100% equity and some sort of firm, should he be getting all the profits? That's a different thing than we're producing enough right now to feed everybody and we need to redistribute it. These are two why, fun... What, what's the big, like, why do you think there needs to be one person who, who has this autocratic control of any institution. Like, where? Wh what's the... Well, there doesn't need to be one person. The there could be multiple logic? investors. There could be partnerships. There could be a publicly traded company with a bunch of shareholders. I mean... Why does it have to be that way? Why? Do, like, what? what's the reasoning? Just because that's the way it is now? How do you dole you out ownership in a company? Investors? What do you mean? Who owns the company? I mean, I Everyone guess... Everyone owns it. Everyone who works there owns it. Well, then they Boom. all have to cough up the capital to do it. Boom. I mean, then they can there go does. make their own company. <laughs> like, what do you mean? If you want to do that, if you want to get 20 workers together and they all have 10 grand that they want to throw into a company, well, then they, they're welcome to go and do it. The thing is that they don't have 10 grand. Okay. They don't well, have 10 grand. Nobody has the, the capital to do it. We're, we're, we're locked into the system from birth in most cases. If you look at, like, the chances of, a, of a, somebody born into poverty escaping poverty, 
it's very low. And by the way, the United States has a lower chance of a person escaping poverty than the, than Vietnam. That's a little sure, statistic. Vietnam also has the highest, the fastest increasing amount of diabetes type two in Southeast Asia. I mean, like we can do like random like number stats like all day long. I know, I, that, but that's, that's that was a jab. What? Okay. So I mean, like this is these, these, this isn't relevant. Like, I, I, I th it's very hard for me to like. I can't address like moral arguments within like the framework of capitalism. Like you're like basically saying like uh, like if I re if I increase the cost on this thing, won't less people buy it? And I'm like, yeah. And you're like, that's evil. And I'm like, no, that's just a fact of the matter. Now, if you want to talk about like should people be able to afford something? Oh, I totally agree. So let's talk about policies. How could we fix that? But you can't just say like here's an observation of capitalism. Isn't that evil? Well, no. It's just an observation. This is a reality of capitalism. Like this is how firms. I guess operate. what I'm saying is, can here's the here's the thing. Here's 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 my biggest question for you, I guess. This is what it all boils down to. Okay. Can we not come up with a better way of doing things? Yeah, I mean, I capital? think, I hope we can, maybe, but this seems so, to be the best so, we have so far, so what and every time I talk to an anarchist or a communist, they never can, they can't even tell me how a factory is organized, like, let alone any of the more common. I told you. I, no, you that's not fair, because I gave you plenty of little hypotheticals. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait. Let's revisit that then, and you can remind me. So let's say you have a factory with 70 white workers and 30 black workers, and the white workers don't ever want to vote for a black manager. What does this factory appeal to if you don't have a state or anything to appeal to? How, how, do, how do the black workers get their grievances? I told heard? you that they would have a government. They could have governments that they could appeal to, all right? Like in terms of the, the communal organizations, they can appeal to those. They can appeal what if the, to what if the black people, because this is very likely, what if they're just a minority in the society? So in the, in the communal boards, they don't have very much black representation either. Do they just have to then violently have to rise up or? They it, hopefully not. Because I mean, I, you said I, it yourself I, that in Alabama or whatever, you wouldn't want that state to immediately change over to like some stateless society because all the black people get fucked, right? Didn't you say that? Okay, so so let's not put the cart before the horse in terms of what we advocate for as anarchists in terms of revolutionary praxis. So we're, we think that you have to have the systems in place before you can make the change. So like, for instance, the, the, the secondary and dual power structure thing is like totally key. And we need to be building, like, like we say, we need to be building those right now under capitalism. We need to have those right now under capitalism. We need to have, you know, organizations of trans people, organizations of syndicates. We need to have, like, people organized right now. And yeah, as how they would you enforce those strength. structures once you disband your government? How do you enforce it? What if everybody's just like, say, okay. oh, oh. What? Yeah. Do you not think that it is a form of violence? It's violent. State violence is, is an everyday occurrence in the United States of America. If Amen. I'm hungry yeah, it is. on the street... And I want to go if I'm hung, if I'm starving and I go into a grocery store, and I want to get an apple to eat, the police can come out and arrest me, lock me up for a couple years, shoot me, whatever. They have the violent. They have the monopoly on violence that allows them to violently enforce what they think is the proper way to distribute things. So if I say that a, a group of uh, black workers in a factory with 30% black and 70% white, and they're being, I mean, we're, it depends on the scale of um, oppression, of course, like like. You know, it okay, depends so like, on the degree I, like, that you're being oppressed. I can, I feel but like if the if the seventy percent are like, we're not going to work at all. I mean, then yeah, of course that would be an instance where they, it, it, it violence meets violence. You know, it's like if 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 the seventy percent of the white workers are com you're, you, like you're using this weird. I I'm not using anything weird, like believe it or not. It was a fact but of like the world if, that slavery was real, 70, that segregation right. existed, that white people didn't want to work with black people. They didn't even want to go to the same schools as them. It's crazy. Yeah, so, I mean, this isn't so just a if hypothetical. 70%, if 70% of those white workers are so completely unopen to change and to listen to those black people, then I think those black people have every right and to use whatever means they need to, to take control of their own lives and their own labor. And yes, if that if it comes down to the fact that those white people are so rapidly, aggressively racist that they're basically having some kind of workshop slavery system, then that would be an yeah, I would advocate for violence in that situation. But I don't think people are that unreasonable. And I, I think mean, that I think that yeah. the seventy percent of white workers would probably like when the thirty percent of their coworkers, the people that they work with every day, when that thirty percent of black workers come to them and say, Hey, look, this is a problem. We really want you to address this. I think that people will work together and they will solve those problems. The same way that people in the legislative system of a state do, only better because in this situation you're representing yourself directly. You're not electing some representative to go and hope that they do what you want them to do. You're coming to the table yourself and you're and you're buying into the system yourself and you have ownership of the system yourself. That gives you a confidence and strength in representing yourself that we don't have in the in the state that we have right now we're, have you we're seen how like the average person treats like you said it yourself earlier a disabled person or a trans person but somehow in your world these people will just magically come together and 
love each it's other. It's not and... magic at all. It's going to take a ton of work and a ton of pain, and it's going to be a painful process. But the, but that the has point to like is not... start under capitalism. Like most of these structures already need to be there under capitalism for this to even work. You said we need to. Well, yeah. Okay. So this is where there might be a little bit of disconnect. Yeah. So I'm not saying tomorrow let's all go get our AK-47s and overthrow capitalism. No. I'm saying here's here's how here's how anarchists want a lot of anarchists want to do things. We want to start building and organizing these structures right now. And there are ways that people do it that are completely nonviolent, the opposite of violence. So for instance, Food Not Bombs is a really great example of like an anarchist organization. They get together, they get the food, they distribute it. They don't they don't use the state intervention at all. In fact, the state has has blocked Food Not Bombs from distributing food to people in the past. So we can do these things now. We don't have to wait for some some proverbial revolution. It's not like a it's not like a, a doomsday cult where we're all saying, okay, as soon as the revolution happens, we're gonna overthrow the factory. No, we're saying unionize right now, make a militant union right now, make a trade union right now, make food not bombs programs right now, start organizing your community right now. These are things we can do that are anarchist practice praxis that we could put into effect right now and, and start building the society that we wanna see. Starting with our own backyard, starting with our own personal lives. It's not a, it's not like a utopian revolution and then everything's going to be great. It's like we what we're trying to do is turn people on to this mindset and this method of analysis where we look at hierarchies and we try to dismantle them wherever we find them, wherever they're, they're unjust. And that's yeah. all it is. It's right. as simple as that. Yeah. Racism is product of hierarchy. And you know what? Capitalism is using it so well. What is the purpose of racism? I believe that the purpose of racism is that to convince and to persuade people that you're better than the other one by just you're looking that was certainly the, some the people case are in the South just East. racist yes. i mean yes yes okay but it's exacerbated yeah. by yeah, because by... like when you're racist and you believe that you're white and then you deserve a better life condition you deserve a higher wage than black people that's the product that's the thing that's the weapon that capitalism is used so well to separate us and living in the anarchism society right and a com no communism society that like people are free to move in or move out of a society. Yeah, but there have been socialist societies or communist societies or worker ran societies that have also like tried to kill Jewish people or gay people. Like that's not just a That's That's so never that's happened. That's thing. that's not true. That's not a thing would happen because in a communism society, racism doesn't work. You will all have share the same thing. And if you're racist to the other people, you can get any more than him and you, him can get any more than you. And if you don't want, and if you still want to be racist yourself, just go to the other community, find the society that you feel well, that we you do. can do. So we have, this, we, have this, uh, we have this, another important concept of anarchism is, is free association. And so that's the idea that like, uh, if nobody should be forced to like, uh, I want to be careful with this because it's not going in the direction that you probably think it is. It's more complicated than it sounds. But like nobody should be forced to work with other people that they feel are exploiting or abusing them or what have you. Or uh, so. So the situation. It, it's not to say that like the seventy percent of white workers that have all the power, like shouldn't have to work with the black people. But it's to say that like if the thirty percent minority group feels like they're being abused, then they have every right to try to build their own power structure okay and that doesn't mean like like if you if you if you use this hypothetical example of one factory in an isolated situation it it, it all breaks down because anarchism is like again a way of analyzing every system and and how they work together yeah so but like this... we can construct more systems to work on our hypothetical too I just want like the whole point of a hypothetical is just to isolate some principle that you have yeah. so that I can understand. Yeah. Okay. So the, when you so, keep so withdrawing you a better... from the hypothetical and say it's too complicated, okay. I don't no, even no, know no, like no, what no, we're. No, 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 no. It's yeah. not too complicated, but let's just okay. I'll I'll go down the road. I'll go down the road. Okay. So the thirty percent of the black people, they the first step that they would do, I would say that it would probably escalate, right? Depending on how much resistance they get from the seventy percent majority group, right? Okay. So if the thirty percent minority group, the first thing they would probably do is, you know, form their direct their uh, dual power structure, come together, come up with a proposal for a solution. And then they would bring that to like the larger body, the larger council of workers. And they would say, look, here are the problems that we see. Here is our proposed solution and let's talk about it. And then they would have a discussion. Now, ideally, if everyone's reasonable and the, and, and the complaints are legitimate and the solution makes sense, the ideal thing, it would end there and they would just ratify this and put that into place. Now, okay. maybe the 70% of people are being kind of shitty and they're like, eh, we'll make some concessions, but not a lot. Well, okay, that's not the end of the line. They can then go and they can talk to other factories, you know, and other places of work 
and they can build a larger dual power structure, which is like a council of councils of you know this minority group's representation across a lot of different factories. And then they can say like, okay, we're all going to put pressure on this one factory because this one factory is being shitty. And there are lots of different ways that they could put pressure this on This is it. like the same um, arguments that libertarians make for why we should remove protected classes in the United States. Well, I didn't finish the road. The, the okay, last yeah, step would going. be if, if, the, if the factories don't, you know, if the factories can't solve it on, them, on their own, then there would be a community government. And, it, you know, depending on the size of the community and everything, it might in many ways resemble what you think of as a state because there might be like, I mean, they would have like, they would have teeth in certain ways. They would they would have the ability to say, hey, like you can't exploit people. Or what, and they're not going to let violence you. or? Uh, usually I don't think it would come down to violence. Usually I think it would come okay, down to... these, like, you have, like, the I mean, oh, it's a, world. Come on, I mean, that, that, that's what the police do in the, in the United States, is they enact violence. I mean, I don't well, think but, like, that so we you would have like, to... like, you have a racist community that just doesn't like black people, and now you've made it so that they can say, hey, we can vote black people out of our factory, that's awesome. You're telling me that, like, a third-party commune or whatever is gonna come and say, well, actually, you guys need to shape up, and they'll be like, oh, okay. That's and... what happened in the, in the United States. No, I mean, with no. The, with the civil there was a lot of you know, violence in the United States when it came to civil rights and stuff. It was loaded with violence. Yeah, what do you mean? Yeah, so there will probably be some violence. I mean, I'm not going to say that there will never be I mean, what, 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 but what, but I'm saying we would try to reduce violence by making these organizations democratic and well, giving the Well, but right now, who, by like vesting like violence in the state, by giving the state the sole authority on violence, it seems like you can disincentivize some racial behavior. Like, hey, you might think that racist behavior might be good, but by the way, if you do it, you're going to face these consequences because we've trusted the state to enact certain measures yeah. against you if you do it. So even if you are racist, it disincentivizes you from doing it. Anarchists have all of those tools available, but we, we would not use them in the same way as the as the state as the capital state. So, if if your hypothetical situation, I mean, I'm just saying, if you had a if you did have a community that was like aggressively racist and was aggressively <laughs> I, exploiting, you say this like people, it's so improbable, like an aggressively no, racist. No, no, no. I'm saying like if you if in my hometown, if you're like in my hometown, okay, I think it's justifiable to for for people to occupy that's and and perhaps even if it comes down to it, use violence. To resist, like, so if you have, a, it's just like uh, when you have fascists in the street that are going around and and uh, targeting uh, and bullying LGBTQ people or or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's totally justifiable to go up and punch the Nazi or to do what you have to do to make the person secure or to make the community safe. I mean that. Yeah, I'm not a. I'm not like a. I'm a pacifist in the sense that I want to avoid violence as much as possible and try to find nonviolent solutions for things. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about people who are so violent themselves in the sense that they want to oppress dominate and exploit a, a minority group then that might be a situation where that calls for violence unfortunately but it might be yeah okay. i mean i'm not saying it wouldn't it yeah, sounds I mean, like I the difference understand. in the violence that you're talking about ej is like you're you're the you justify violence when it's coming from the bottom up towards someone at the top of the hierarchy down and then just i mean but well with Destiny, that's an violence. Violence i would say too, this right? violence is justified when it prevents further violence. Oh, hey, and that's my justification for state violence. <laughs> I mean, all state violence yeah, being justified just under the assumption that like, it, it decreases other violence. I mean, that's the whole reason why we, we, why we trust the state with so violent authorities, so we're not all violent towards one another, right? But the police uh, heavily favor the elite protected class. And as an example of that, uh, I mean, this is a non-hypothetical. This is just from my lived experience. When I had my home burglarized when I was like 20 years old and I was just this poor guy living in a house with five other poor people. Mm -hmm. um, the police came out and they said, eh, probably not much we can do. And they left. But when I had my business burglarized, it wasn't even really a burglarized. I think it was a false alarm, but the police came out, they checked everything. They took fingerprints. They like had this whole operation because it was a business. And, and that's a small micro example, but generally speaking, that way, hold the, on. Firstly. Okay. If somebody broke into your house and you call police over, I mean, like, if there is, like, evidence that they can collect, they'll do it. But most break-ins are, like, somebody, like, smashed a window and they went in and they stole some shit. There's not going to be, like, some, like, crazy amount of, like, investigatory work that's going to, like, turn but up. But there was for my business. I, this, I don't know if, like, the, the net worth of your business was, like, super high or something. Like, this is, like, a great, like, one-off story. But, I okay, mean... Okay, here's a better example. Here's a better example. Like, like black people and, 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 and trans people and a lot of people are like terrified of calling the police and it would be like dangerous for someone to call the police 
in, in a lot of communities because they might get shot even though they're the victim. Do you see what I'm saying? So like, no, that's totally unrelated to what you said before. <laughs> like there are group, there are, there are elite classes. So right, let's say somebody, let, let's say that like, I'm, I'm, I think somebody's about to kill me and I call the police. Are they protecting me because I'm an elite class or you, black people can even go, believe it or not, black people do call the police sometimes too. If they feel like their lives are under threat and the police show up and they don't just kill the black people all the time. I know it happens sometimes, but it's pretty rare, but uh, there are, are I, I, there are many, if not most, black people are, have trepidation about getting Yeah, I'm sure they do, but it's not like there's like a 60 percent chance that when you call the cops as a black person, they're going to show up and kill you. Like, that's this. I didn't is, say that, but I said that the police that? protect the police protect certain classes far more than they protect other classes, and the police are much more violent towards certain classes than other classes. Some I don't disagree with that, classes. but these classes that you're talking about. Like, when we talk about things like race, this isn't addressed under mm -hmm. your quasi-whatever system you're talking about, non-hierarchical. Why do you think it's not addressed? Because communism doesn't fix racial problems. I hope you don't think it you does. You cannot have communism until you have some unity between the races. I mean, I, I would just say that, like, it's a prerequisite that we, to see the way that these hierarchies function in society. That's why I'm saying. A big part of anarchist revolution is education and and socialization of these ideas and making them mainstream and public. And, and it happens quickly. Like five years ago, I was like a misogynistic, uh, had a lot of latent ra racism. I still have, I still struggle with those issues and I'm still trying to dismantle it within my own mind. I'm not, I'm absolutely not saying that I'm perfect, but you can learn the basics of the stuff pretty quickly and learn to start dismantling your own misogyny, your own racism, your own homophobia. It's not like a big ask, but the first step is understanding the, the role that race and homophobia and all these other things do the role that they play in our society and the way that these power structures are used to keep some people on top and keep some people on the bottom. So this is not some anarchism is something that has to happen from the ground up. Absolutely. You can't How have do you feel a about, vanguard. Do you think that there, do you think that Vietnam struggles with racist problems right now against the, the, is it Dagars? I don't know how to pronounce this. Yeah. There are ethnic minorities that have a lot of problems with uh, suppression in, in Vietnam. But um, how is this sure. possible if it's a communist government? I, I already told you I'm not here to completely defend Vietnam. I'm just here to set the record straight that there's a lot of misinformation about Vietnam and the, the capitalist media makes it seem a lot worse than it is. But that's not to say that I will okay. defend every single action that the Vietnamese government does because I'm not a Marxist Leninist. Okay. Okay. I mean, that that's just. Is there the any. Is. I'm there's just curious, just for my reading later, is there any country that you can point to at any point in human history that exemplifies like the values that you're talking about? I think some of them that came the closest, I can give you a few examples. Uh, Spanish Catalonia existed for, I think, about four years. They increased productivity of the working of the workers. Uh, they did fail because of, I would say, more political reasons, um, because of like a lack of unity between the liberal uh, anarchists and the Marxist Leninists. And some you know, there's a lot of like subterfuge going on. But when they were when Catalonia was an anarchist society, by all accounts, it functioned very smoothly, and it was uh, a pretty good example of a success story. There was the uh, free territories in the Ukraine, very similar story. Um, there was th today there is, um, and I'm not going to say that this is perfect either, but northern Syria, uh, Rojava, which I talked about earlier, they are trying to work towards a more anarchistic society. They are doing a lot of things right in terms of creating the women's councils I talked about in terms of trying to educate. So this is another thing that Rojava does. They have education like all the time for their community. So like the whole com community comes together and they talk about these things. They have like, uh, you know, people will like give basically workshops on taking ownership and, and, gov and self-government and that sort of thing. It's a big part of it is education and, 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 and teaching people how to govern themselves. That was something that uh, when I spoke to the internationalist commune of Rojava, they said that was a that's a big part of the struggle in Rojava is that a lot of people they so Rojava, the, the Kurdish people have been like brutally dominated by, you know, other powers for most of their existence. And they to being dominated that they didn't know how to govern themselves. So they're they're actively trying to build workshops to teach the people, you know, how to enact self-government. So that's a big part of that. Then you can also look at I don't think that they self-describe themselves as anarchistic, but certainly the Zapatistas uh, Wait, in, dude, in hold Chiapas. on. I'm sorry, just because I'm not I'm not super familiar with this. So the Rojava's People Military Force is the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces. Yes. They used to be the Yepigi, I think. Were these people not like funded and backed by the United States? They did, they do have, or they have had, uh, 
joint military operations against ISIS, yeah, and they helped to defeat ISIS side by side with the United States forces, I would call that something I would I would personally a lot of anarchists actually think that Rojava is like some kind of like imperialist US backed organization. Uh, I don't see it that way. I think that it was a necessary evil sort of deal where it was like they were in a really shitty situation. They had to fight against ISIS on one side and Turkey on the other. And the United States offered them some military aid and support and they took it. Now, there are anarchists who disagree with me about that. That's the way that I personally see it from my own research. Okay. Um, and, and also Rojava has changed a lot and is changing a lot. So they used to be Marxist Leninist. The, the 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 people that you know live in that in the Rojavan territory now used to be Marxist Leninist and uh, they have been working towards uh, a more anarchistic I think I think so there's the leader Ocelon who bases most of his ideas on uh, anarchist thinkers like Murray Bookchin I believe um, so they're they're working towards that it's not something that can happen overnight anarchism is a I, I, one of the biggest criticisms of anarchism is that it tends to be a slower process than than a vanguard Marxist-Leninist party, where you just have one party go in and get the guns and overthrow the state. Anarchism is it, it's going to require people to govern themselves, and we are not currently necessarily equipped or socialized to do that. And it, and 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 that's that's a big part of the struggle, is um is teaching people how to control our own lives. We've been so dominated for so long by so many different forms of oppression that we will have to go through a maturing process and a lot of struggling with ourselves to learn. And, and, and these are problems that we have in our anarchist community. I mean, we're, we, st we still have a lot of uh, things out in terms of how we can work together uh, across racial divisions, across, you know, uh, LGBTQ plus slash like cis heteronormative divisions. Th these, are, these are definitely like pain points. And these are places where we're still working out the solutions to a lot of these problems. But the point is that we are working diligently to figure out the solutions to these problems so it's a process it's not a it's not a, like a formula a magical formula for a perfect world it's a process and it's a lens through which to view the world okay i mean i'd rather reform the system that i live in now that i feel like works for the most part and has some problems that can be patched and fixed rather than I guess like jumping face to a whole new system that I feel like doesn't even necessarily address those problems. But I mean, maybe we progress to yours at some point in the future after enough reform, which I think is fine if that happens. Well, how much time? I mean, do you not agree that the? I mean, how do you feel about the environment? Um, I mean, like the 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 fact that we're hurtling towards uh, irrecoverable destruction of our. Ecology. Yeah, that's really bad. But what about it? Do you not think that? I mean, so so do you agree? Like, do do you believe the findings that? It's about like what ten or twelve years before it's irreversible. The climate destruction. Do you, um, have you heard that, or do you agree with? I that? mean, I've, I've the no, different numbers get thrown around all the time, but yeah, obviously, climate change is like a really bad thing. Do you think that reform and and the capitalist systems that we have now equipped to address that in time? And are you seeing the movement that's needed, the drastic movement that's needed happening in any way? Under um, it's not. Capitalism definitely has the tools to address the problem, but the problem is the people, not the economic system. The problem, can you explain that? Elaborate on that? The problem sure, like is half the people, the people in the United the, States, I don't even know if they think climate change is even real. Like, if you look at, like, the Republican Party, these aren't people that are going to vote in their worker co-ops to reduce pollution. <laughs> like, huh. Well, that's the United States. Most countries don't have that same perception. And also, I'll say that... The, you think that, the like, most that developing countries that... would eschew, like, further development in order to make, make their lives more painful because they're worried about climate change? No, I'm saying that most countries besides the United States, don't have a population that is majority climate change denial. Denier. Den, den, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> okay, sure. Den, denial um, but, but, but you will also say, I, I, I will also say that um, the fact, the reason that a lot of these people have these misconceptions about climate change is because of the enormous amount of wealth that is spent to basically brainwash people into believing that there's no climate change. And this money is spent by capitalists who have the wealth and the means and the power to, you know, get their voice broadcast in a way that uh, people who don't have that wealth are unable to do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I mean, in any type of society where people's jobs are tied into energy, like uh, fossil fuels, I would expect those same people to be lobbying the government like crazy as well. And actually, in your society, I could be wrong, maybe you have another out for this, but in your society, you wouldn't even be able to change it because you'd have to impose on them, hey, your jobs need to not exist anymore. We're shutting you down. I don't know how you would do that without a state government um, or, or, or some violence vested in some third-party authority. 
do you think that like somebody who works on a oil refinery that's uh, producing oil for like a giant corporation, if I said to them like, hey, uh, instead of just working on oil platforms, uh, why don't you come back and we'll give you some food and a house and we'll give you another job? Do you think they would resist that hard? I mean, in your th- th- we're no, not saying that they're going to the ma- be the, no, no, no. Yeah, they the wouldn't. Street. In the magical world where you have enough food and resources and everything for everybody, regardless yeah, of who not, works what jobs, and you bring them back, then no, they would agree with it. I mean, I can never argue. It's with not that. magical. We have enough food. We have enough food, and we have enough housing. You only I have mean, enough food whole, because people the... are producing it under a capitalist system. You don't. You're, there's no guarantee that if you just like, I, I don't even know how you would distribute this food, but there's no guarantee that these people would produce this food otherwise in any other system. Like, so you think the reason that migrant workers are working in the fields to make food for like. 25 cents an hour is because of the because they care about the profit motive of the corporations that they're working for no why would you ever expect a labor to care about the profit motive of a corporation that's not what labor's job is labor's job is to secure the highest amount of wages they can for the least amount of work yeah and then so that that brings you to the great contradiction of capitalism because how is that a contradiction the, cor- the corporation's incentive is to lower wages as much as possible and get them to work as much as possible and but at the same time they want buyers for their products yeah, of Which course. A, fir- a, for- a firm's job. Company. Yeah, of course. A firm's job is to reduce costs as much as possible, and a, a laborer's job is to increase costs as much as possible. Yeah, this isn't a contradiction. So, this is a market negotiation. Would you would expect it, this to happen. Would it not be better? Would it not be better if a firm's job, instead of being like completely yoked and harnessed to the profit motive of the uh, individual capitalists or capitalists at the top of the hierarchy, and just doing what they say for the profits of those people? Maybe instead, it's like, hey, how can we structure and organize this company so that it is and I have some, some numbers on this. Uh, what if we structured this company so that instead of just being harnessed to the my profits as the owner, what if instead we structured things so that we care more about things like the work life quality, the quality of work life for the workers and the benefits that we have to society? Well, then uh, no one's going to invest money at, in your company. They're going to go invest money in a company that's making more profits. Well, if you look at, uh, there's a study by Virginia Periton, it was, it was like a overview of a lot of different studies about worker cooperatives versus capitalist firms. One of the big points of that, is, uh, one of the big takeaways uh, that Valerie had was that um, like in a for-profit privately owned corporation, the it, if there's a sudden like drop in demand for something, the like a, sh- a demand shock, the private corporations solve that problem by firing people and like just like fucking over a lot of their workforce, whereas the cooperatives tend to, instead, they'll like come together and just lower wages, but keep everybody employed. So my point is that like, and, and yeah, this, we address and, and this. Yeah, there's a way. Of, yeah. So firstly, of course, you're not going to fire people because they're all co-owners of the company. You can't fire them. Firstly. Secondly, yeah, corporate like in firms in a capitalist society tend to reduce costs when they're when they're receiving less income. That makes sense because lowering wages is something that socially people can't handle. It's a really, really hard thing as a company to cut wages. But like this is something that you address with your monetary policy. This is one of the reasons well, why. Well, well, you could cut the wages of like. Jeff Bezos, and I don't think it's going to be that much of a struggle. I don't think um, that cutting you know, Jeff Bezos' wages is going to like fund the however many hundreds yeah, of thousands knew, of employees work at Amazon. I don't think they're going to make a lot I of knew, money. I knew you were going to say that because the the thing about it is, is that like well, I was going to say that because it was a dumb argument. I mean, no, 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 it's not a dumb argument because under the wage system, it's not just a fact that the the, the problem with Jeff Bezos and, and billionaires having that much money and power, it's not like there's a finite amount of dollars in the world. And if we took Jeff Bezos' dollars and we distributed them to everybody, then everyone, no, that's not the way that the economies work. The 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 f- values of dollars and the amount of dollars fluctuates like second by second. The, the reason Jeff Bezos has entrenched stable power is because he has such an enormous amount, amount of wealth that he has such an enormous, enormous amount of power that he could just s- dominate lots and lots and lots and lots of people. So Wait, it's this, not hold on. I actually that, don't like, know this. Does Jeff the... Bezos own a controlling share of Amazon, or can the board fire him if his performance is bad? Does anybody know this in chat? Is he even like a is he even like a majority owner in the company, or could he just be fired by the shareholders? I don't, I don't know. It doesn't. If if he got fired, or if he was already fired, he still has billions of dollars, which still gives him power over society. Not over Amazon, though. Oh, he has fourteen percent, so he could get fired at any time by the board. They could just fire him. What like? So he yeah, and he have still total... has his billions of dollars, and he could still go fund a super PAC and get whatever he wants 
Wait, well, we covers. just jumped on. To, we just jumped so many topics away. That was like a super. Okay. That was like a double jump. Like, you're, oh my god! Like wanna, you're talking about no, over so, Amazon. So, he clearly doesn't have. If he's only got a ten percent stake, he could be voted out or fired. Like, I'm not talking just about Amazon. I'm talking about. That's my point. That's my point. I'm not saying that if we cut Jeff Bezos's wages and just distributed them to all of the workers, that that would solve the problem, because Jeff Bezos already has the billions of dollars, which gives him power which is like irrevocable. If you look at like M- uh, McAfee or McAfee or whatever, the dude that made the Yeah, I'm not going to disagree that having proven. money gives you more power in our society today. I'm never going to disagree with that. So I don't know what you're arguing. Like, and there are some people that have so much power that it's like they're, they're like, they have way too much power. It's, like, it, how, like, I don't even like know. Power and money that he can, the U.S. president. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have... Well, like it's a form of oligarchy where you have a, a, a very small, so much wealth and power. I just don't see how that makes like how that sits right with anyone. I don't yeah, know. I guess how I just would don't... you how would you uh, solve for that problem? Because that seems like where we're headed at now, right? Even in countries like Sweden and Norway, they still have this issue. So how would you solve for that? Of the consolidation of power in just the hands of a few. Who is who is that addressing? That's addressing you. Um, so, I mean, like, the, I don't know how much I'm focused on inequality here amongst, like, the literal highest earners in society, um, more so of, like, inequality within cities, which seems to be, like, a really high predictor verse for crime. So if you have, like, very poor areas of a city and very wealthy areas, it seems like that produces a lot of social unrest. And then making sure that, like, the minimum standards of living for people in a country are high. So, for instance, if you live in a first world country today with the wealth available to us, you probably should have health care. You should have a place to live. You should have, like, food to eat. Um, you should be able to afford, like, education. Like, these are things that um, you, you absolutely should have. So, I mean, however much uh, however much wealth an economy is generating needs to be allocated in that way via some sort of government policy. So you, you would still try to get everybody the same things that's in EJ's system. It's just you have a different way of doing it because he wanted to give everybody food and health care and housing and it sounds like you're saying the same thing well yeah but you would do this through like subsidies or tax programs i don't think that just like having the government come in and like temp- either centrally planning it or like forcing people to give something away or like well, stealing people's houses and then giving it to people i don't know if like this would be like the way to do it like if you want to talk about like the housing thing to people if you wanted to start a program with the government where you like bought houses at market value and then distributed those to people and you funded that tax um by, by say people that like there's like a real estate tax like a one percent real estate tax i don't know what it would be goes in and like funds that program yeah i'd be all in favor of that sure what what why do we need to be in a position where we as like the billions of the world 60 percent of the world at least making less than five dollars per day have to beg for the scraps of the capitalists who control you know 50 percent of the wealth because that's the reality of it those people have no power otherwise if it came down to a fight we would just nuke them all i mean that's the reality of how it goes we have to figure out a way to, to navigate the world right now where we help all the poor people of the world but like forcibly redistributing it from everybody is probably never going to happen that's fantastic it's being forcibly redistributed from the workers to the to the capitalists that's what's happening the the workers are are going in and they're putting in the work that is generating the wealth Workers and don't. Workers the, aren't the sole creators of wealth. What workers can't. Workers don't generate any wealth on their own. They have to be introduced to resources via capital to do it. Like it's not like a worker like has this magical like labor that's just being destroyed by capitalists or eaten up by them. Like they. they that's have not no, what I said. I just said that if if you you want to talk about taxes, I mean a profit is a tax on a worker's paycheck. If I if I had a company, I had a company with fifteen employees, and each of them got paid you know whatever ten dollars, fifteen dollars an hour, whatever I was paying them, and then I would take like that same amount of money and put it in my pocket or put it, you know, well, why don't they just go the work business? for themselves then? I already told you because they only have a thousand dollars in the bank paycheck to paycheck. Sure, so it sounds like they need access to something. That, year they need access to, to something. To company. Yeah. They need access to something that you're going to provide them. So I don't see why it's wrong for you to make some money off of that. If I'm going to provide you the resources. They're, well, come on. They're, they're, come on you what? think that like uh, Walmart is providing the means to eventually start their own business not like, the means to start the your board? own business no. but the means for you to earn money if all you can do is like flip burgers you're not going to make any money with that unless somebody gives you like patties to flip and a stove to work on i mean that's like a pretty basic understanding what, why why do you think somebody would only be able to flip burgers I mean, that's just one like, example if you can only weld machines if you can only grow produce if you can only be uh, a lawyer you need a law firm to practice that if you can only be a doctor or a surgeon you need a hospital who can only work. flip burgers like name you know are there very many people that can only flip burgers 
I don't know why you we're focusing on that can... example, but I'd say probably like younger. I mean, because it was a weird thing to say. Like, what do you uh, mean? So I'm like, sorry. My background is I worked. At, I, I, so I worked who... at McDonald's when I was in high school, and then I yeah. went to work at a casino and a restaurant. So my and only work, my only, my work, yeah. Now I am. Now that I'm 30, but my only workable skills back then were yeah, I could work in a restaurant and flip burgers. That was pretty much the only skill I had. Uh, is there something wrong with that, or is that like a bad thing to have? Or no, but it sounds like you're saying that like I don't know. It sounds a little bit like that whole conservative. No, like, it didn't oh, sound like, like any conservative so thing at all. I'm saying that some people don't have very many skills and they, they can't make money on their own. I couldn't make money on my own when I was only 17 or okay. 18. I had to go to a, somebody that owned capital and I had to combine my labor with their capital in order, in order to earn something. Without that, I wouldn't be able to earn any money at all. So, I mean, I don't know if this, I agree that this transaction is necessarily unethical. I do think that capitalists have more power today in society than a laborer does, but I don't think it's necessarily unethical that somebody that provides you the means to work also takes some money for your work. Like, well, okay. So, so the, when you were working, you were working, I presume full flipping those burgers. Sure. Yeah. Is that correct? Or yeah. Okay. So like if you had more time, if instead of having to work 40 hours a week, just to barely scrape by flipping those burgers, let's say you only had to work 20 hours per week, you know, doing whatever labor it is, you would have other time to like develop your skills. So, so to me, it's not really, I honestly, can be learned. I, I think that That's the, it. the real crime of capitalism to me is not the fact that people are poor. It's the fact that so much of our time is wasted to benefit such a small number of people. And I think it's the, the, the not enough people focus on the time aspect you, of I'm, it. Is there like, yeah. are, uh, I could be wrong. Are there socialists in Spanish Catalonia? Do these people all have like four hour work days or like? They were the fighting free... a war at the time. So okay, no, what about in the free territories of Ukraine or what about the Rojava they were in also northern fighting Syria? A war. They were <laughs> also fighting a war. See, the places where What about in Vietnam right now? Do you guys have like four hour work days? Extremely exploited places. Vietnam, as Luna explained earlier, has been heavily manipulated by institutions like the World Bank. So, for instance, a really concrete example would be the fact that they used to have a 200% luxury tax on cars. You know, okay. most people around here get around on motorbikes. Um, and that was good for their society because their roads were not very heavily developed. And it just the way the infrastructure worked, it just made more sense. Like now the World Bank and I, I, it might have been the World Bank, but uh, yeah, I think it was the World Bank came in and, and was it the World Bank, Luna? It doesn't matter. You can look this up. They came in and they put pressure and they said, you have to uh, reduce this. You have to get rid of this luxury tax on cars. And now like everyone's getting cars, which yes. sounds great, but it's completely fucking That's, up their entire infrastructure. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, so so and, and the imperialism that happens in Vietnam ten, tends to be like Korean and Japanese companies. So you look at a, a Vietnamese company like 20 years ago. And yeah, that back then and even when I first moved to Vietnam, the, the people valued their time with their family and, and their, their free time a lot more. Yes. And they didn't have this whole capitalist mindset of like, we have to work all the time. Now these Korean companies and Japanese are coming in, Japanese companies are coming in and they're, um, they're forcing like this, like work, work, work mentality on people. And you could definitely see like social systems starting to disintegrate. You can definitely see like the, just the general happiness of people starting to evaporate. And yes, maybe they're making a little bit more money, but they're miserable. They're working, you know, six days a week and this is under this is because of capitalism not because of socialism yeah. um i mean so okay. it, it, the, the worst the worst thing of vietnam came from capitalism and the best thing we came from socialism <laughs> i i would say that that's true the things that vietnam is doing right are all their programs and the things that they're doing wrong are all the ways that they're both being imperialized and today now they're starting to imperialize other countries which i there's another criticism i have of vietnam because they're going into places like africa and cambodia and and they're in Myanmar, and they're building like, you know, telecom corporations there that are imperializing those developing countries just the same way that Korea and Japan are, corporate, are uh, imperializing Vietnam. So, I mean, but, but okay, but to actually go back and actually answer your question. No, we haven't had a, an anarchist society in peacetime, you know, in a developed country situation yet. Uh, and I think that just because it hasn't happened, that's not an argument that it cannot ever happen or will not ever happen. So... Yeah, couldn't you have made the same argument about capitalism back when we had feudalism? Uh, is that, that to like, me? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, people seem to bring up that meme all the time that like just because like uh, a feudalist would make the same arguments. Um, but I don't know. The arguments for capitalism seemed compelling and the capitalism has worked. Uh, the arguments for socialism seem fantastical. Um, socialists are like, I mean, I guess I could say constantly killing each other and involved in conflict, but apparently that's always the fault of like other capitalists. But if anything, that just makes me want to be more capitalist because I sure as hell wouldn't want to be in a socialist country being killed by capitalists. So um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. What are you, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Like, well, it sounds like you're reference? saying that like the reason why all these socialist countries keep failing is because they're constantly embittered in like wars and stuff. Vietnam's I, not, Vietnam's not failing. Okay. 
Okay. What about? They're doing, uh, they're or, doing I don't okay. know if I. Okay. How about this? Have you heard about the thirty thousand men, women, and children who are being held against their will in state-run detention centers in Vietnam? I have not heard of that. I've heard of the millions. That, or how, how many do we have in our detention centers in the USA right now? The immigrants. It's not millions. That, that was wrong. But the thousands that we have in uh, concentration camps run by ICE. I know about those. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about, honestly. I've never oh, heard okay. that. Apparently, you have drug treatment not. centers in Vietnam where people are locked up for two to four years without trial, and they, um, I guess, they just make them work there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I'm not familiar with that. I, I would be happy to look that over, and mm. I guess. Okay, so later, what but, about the U.S.? Why? I mean, why, yeah, why you, do you just if you want to talk about small... enforced, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's definitely problems in the U.S., labor, but I mean, you're the one claiming that your system, like as a prerequisite, solves some of these things. I'm saying that I don't advocate for Vietnam's form of government. I, I've said that how yes. many times now? Okay, I mean that like you could you could do all these whataboutisms with Vietnam, but I'm not advocating advocating for government. Okay. Uh, I would say that a better way to address drug. I think the drugs are a medical problem. I think most crime is a medical problem and should be treated very humanely and and most people commit crime out of desperation from poverty i think and 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 that includes drug crimes you know so i think if you solve the material scarcity problem then a lot of the almost all of the crime evaporates and then you don't have to have this big huge uh militarized police force to enforce everybody you just have you know a few people that are able to like solve a really crisis type emergency situations. Um, but you know, that's, that's getting into the weeds. The point of the matter is I'm not advocating for Vietnam's system of government. So I don't see how that's really relevant to the conversation here. Okay. Um, um yeah. What else? What is, is there anything else Faraday speaks? Um, yeah, I had a question here. One second. What, what, what's the end game? What do you think the end game is for liberalism and capitalism? The end game for capitalism? Um, I don't know, like in a perfect world, some slow reform to some type of socialist system sounds good on paper, I think, maybe, I'm not sure. Um, but I mean, like, obviously, like the big problems right now that we have in the United States, well, the biggest problem is that people don't even agree that there's a problem. Um, a lot of people think that the system is fine or that we that certain things don't need to change. Um, so, I mean, that's a huge problem. Obviously, like covering our basics in the United States is, is still a problem. Like in a country where so many people are fat, we probably shouldn't have people that are starving um, or people that are homeless or people that don't have health insurance. Like these are all things that can be fixed with government programs, but half the country seems unwilling to, to look or explore that as an option. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, like, I mean, that's like, I don't know the end stages, but that, that's definitely the next thing that needs to happen. Okay. Um, EJ, anything from you? No, I guess, um, you know, this, this, I didn't intend for this to be as a uh, combative. But, uh, <laughs> That's okay. I feel strongly That's about some good. things. Don't but, worry about it. Yeah. I guess the, the parting, the parting, uh, thought, I guess I'd like to mm -hmm. have you consider is just that I don't see anarchism as like a magical formula where we're going to like instantly transform society. It's just, it's a way of looking at things. It's a way of solving problems and it's a way of, of examining ourselves and trying to dismantle you know, internal and external hierarchies. That's all it really is. And and you can um, you can start applying anarchist principles right now. You don't have to wait for some, you know, magical revolution in the future. We can start doing this stuff right now and making lives better for people right now. And there are anarchists around the world who are doing that. Probably should have talked about that more, but that's, I guess, the last thing I'd like to just leave you with there. Okay, can sure. I have a last word? <laughs> I probably I have, have, a, have a last I word since so you jumped in. Oh, yeah, sure. Lynn, and then real quick, mind. I probably would agree, like, with most, like, any, any slow reform that works, I'm always in favor of. So if you think flattening hierarchies makes people's lives better or lets them keep more money or whatever, if you start slowly doing this in some factories and it, and it ends up like empirically working, then I'm 100% in favor of that. And I would hope that most people would be as well, too. So, yeah. What ways do you think that left like uh, leftists and liberals should be working together on a lot of these issues? Like, do you see any what, what kind of common ground do you see? And are you asking me? I'm asking Destiny. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, me? I don't know. It seems like every... I don't think I've ever met the same leftist twice. It seems like there's like 50 trillion different <laughs> schools of thought. Like, I think even... Um, I, I think even you, like, uh, define yourself as a... Um, what was it? It was an anarcho-intersectionalist communist, I think, was the terminology. Are you talking yeah, about you Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I don't know. It seems like every leftist has, like, uh, different ideas on how to do things. And then historically, there's been, like, a lot of fighting between leftists as well. So, yeah, I don't know. 
What about you, EJ? What do you think? Uh, what way should liberals and leftists be working together? Or can they uh, work together? No, absolutely. Well, first of all, like Destiny is absolutely spot on that, first of all, leftists need to learn to work together better. There's a lot of uh, sectarianism on the left. I think a lot of the labels and, and, and stuff, it's got, it, in a lot of cases, it comes down more to lexicon. And we kind of agree on a lot of things that we agree on the most important things. And with liberals, that's also sort of true. I believe in something called tactical unity, which means if I agree, if, if I have the same goal as somebody else, I will work with them towards it. Um, with some exceptions, like I don't believe in tactical unity with like a outright fascist, but I mean, absolutely. I, I personally, uh, think that voting in elections is very important. I think that working, you know, right now, the only candidates we have available are fairly liberal. Um, so like, obviously I'm going to be voting for a liberal presidential candidate. I, other people in elections and I work with liberals all the time. Uh, I have a stream that I do like weekly with a bunch of my liberal friends. Um, I've worked with liberal campaigns and projects, so I don't feel like we need to have some wall. I, in fact, I think that the best way for us to break down some of these misunderstandings and learn from each other is by working together. So I think the more we can work together functionally where we have goals that are aligned, the better. Sure. Do you, I'm curious if, if Biden was the nominee, would you vote for him over Trump or do you think you'd abstain? I would vote for Biden over Trump, but I fucking hope I don't have to. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I would vote for Biden over Trump for sure. Ugh. Okay. I have some questions from the chat um, for destiny. If he wants to take those. Yeah. What up? Okay. So uh, what do you think the left, right political spectrum should be based on? Uh, it's what it should be based on. I don't know if this answer is a cop out, but like, it depends on where like the, the country is at right now. Um, so, so like in the United States, it seems to be the left, right thing seems to um, center itself around like how much government should have a role in our lives. That seems to be like where the left, right thing falls in the U S and then I'm sure that answer would probably be different for every country. Um, like in the United States, because of uh, how, because of what our current policies are, they're implemented with the government. Like healthcare is a big dividing thing between the left and the right. Um, whereas, like in the UK, it's not quite like that. Like I don't, I could be wrong, but I don't think the Tories want to like completely destroy the NHS. Like maybe people argue over funding levels, but yeah. Okay, um, American, could you speak to the concept of primitive accumulation and then hear Destiny's response? I don't know what that even is. Oh, I've I've seen primitive accumulation i think that they're talking about the if i'm not mistaken i think they're talking about the idea that um like all property is theft because originally the world just like didn't belong to anybody so the basic idea is like how can you justify saying that this land belongs to you or like these resources belong to you like it was always goes back to i could be wrong if i'm wrong i'm wrong but i think that's what they're talking about so the idea is that like there, there's no way especially like in the united states of america we're all completely flat out fucking stolen uh, if you go back to, not too far um but yeah the idea is that like uh and this is something i guess i'd like to hear from destiny if he could briefly chime in but like yeah how, how can you justify saying like i own this piece of land because i bought it from a guy who bought it from a guy who stole it from somebody else who owned it you know previously i guess that's a that's a huge contradiction in, in capitalism in the united states i think um i mean i I, I don't care to even think about it. Like everything would, would devolve into absurdity like very quickly if we were to start to consider who the original owners of land are. Um, I mean like Israel and Palestine can fight over that shit, but I don't want to fight over that in the rest of the world. I don't know who would even be left owning what. I, okay. I agree. <laughs> um, EJ, do you think the focus of anarchism should be to eliminate the root causes of problems like racism or to try to suppress them as the factory scenario discussed? No, I mean... you. For sure, the, the, the goal of it, and, and I, I feel like I failed a bit. This questioner makes me feel sad because I feel like I should have talked about that more. But yeah, for sure, in the factory situation, the, the main priority should be getting at the root, the underlying causes of those tensions and trying to, you know, dismantle them. For sure, the, the first thing we need to be doing is looking at ourselves. And that's something that I do every day. I try to find ways in which I might be having prejudicial uh, thoughts. And I find them all the time. I'm always like rooting around and in my own ideology and my own perspective and my actions and finding ways that I'm being kind of shitty. And, uh, yeah, I think that's the most important thing is for us to try to find the causes of prejudice and exploitation and, and the shit that's happening that sucks and trying to dismantle that at the base level. That's, that's for sure. Something I believe. Okay. Um, destiny. So we were talking about climate change a little bit earlier. 
And you said that you were fine with, you know, going into leftist territory in terms of politics and, and systems, but you said that you want to do slow reform. So do you think that slow reform will help us get over climate change, which is No, I think for climate change, decades? I think we're fucked. I don't think there's any way to solve that. And it should. <laughs> You think hopefully, it's in like game the, there? We're the just, best the best outcome for climate change is that hopefully because climate is so insanely complicated, hopefully that it's it's not gonna go in line with like the moderate or worst predictions of that. And hopefully alternative energies become economically viable due to subsidies or whatever quick enough, or there's some major technological breakthrough. But there is no political or economic reorganization that's going to occur on a global scale in the next twenty years. That's just a fact. I'll I'll give anybody huge odds on that too. It's, it's not gonna happen. Do you generally think that in terms of like a lot of the problems we have, do you think that capitalism, like, do you think we'll just get technological advancements out of capitalism and that will solve our problems? Or Well, that's what some people that... are hoping, which is, it's really mm -hmm. fucking stupid, but some people are hoping that we'll invent our way out of the problem, that we'll invent some magical device that sucks carbon out of the air, or that we'll invent some magical free power that fusion will end up being a good source of energy or something like, that's that's the hope. I, I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not educated enough in any of those fields to say what the probability of that actually happening is, but... Okay. What do you, Destiny, what do you think, um, do you think capitalism is equipped to handle automation? Is, is equipped? Yeah, do you think that there will be a solution for automation under capitalism? Well, the solution is going to be to automate the fuck out of everything and hire the fewest people. A firm's job is always to produce costs, and labor is a cost, so having, yeah. I, I, I assume what he's asking is, like, is there a way for people to be taken care of and not all be poor because there are no jobs left? I mean... This is a kind of a weird thing. I mean, I think I'm pretty sure even Marx like had these thoughts where like, well, once like looms and stuff become more popular, like there's not going to be jobs for everybody. Like we, we've had this thought for the past like 250 years, like throughout all of like industrialization that like, oh, well, once we have these machines, um, there's not going to be jobs for people. So it seems like we keep finding jobs for people, but like, labor continues to specialize. It seems like that continues to happen. Um, if it doesn't, then we would have to have some form of like a Yang UBI or something or some heavily negative tax rate or something in order to give people money. I ideally, that post-scarcity thing would happen, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the concept behind the Venus Project. Someone was asking about that, too. Mm -hmm. um, did that any of you read any leftist theory? Um, no, I've read, I've read like a chapter of Dust Capital. That's it. Fuck that shit. It's so boring. I'd rather kill myself. I have a book by Hume. If I read, I'd much rather read him than fucking Marx, but... Okay. Someone asked me if I would host a debate between Angie Speaks and Destiny. Destiny, would you be uh, up for that? Who? Angie Speaks. Who's who, who's that? Um, she's she's a leftist. Anarchist. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I mean, I guess, sure. Okay. Um, uh, get EJ. too excited. What? <laughs> EJ, do you feel oh. that white said, supremacy... Don't get too excited. <laughs> oh. It's like for Do me, like feel... a lot of these debates on like, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, just like on particular concepts, like I like arguing about rent control. I like arguing about like, um, like universal healthcare. Like these are exciting things to argue about or education. Cause we can look, there are so many examples around the world of like, you know, does universal healthcare work? Let's look at the empirical data. How much does the US spend on healthcare? How many sick people do we have? Um, does rent control work? The before and after is like, we can look to so much, but like these, like the, the, the arguments about socialism are always just like, there's a million reasons why no country is a real socialist country or why they're failing. And there's like, just, it's all like theory and it's, uh, I don't know. It's like not as exciting, I guess, to actually debate. Okay. Yeah, but for me, but all right. EJ, do you feel that white supremacy is an example of hierarchy that exists in our day-to-day -day life that anarcho-communism can dismantle? Uh, yeah, I, I do believe it's, uh, I would say the anarchists, side of my ideology speaks more to the fact of, to the problem of racism but for sure uh race is a, is a highly hierarchical social construct that uh needs to be dismantled and i believe you know the model i would use for explaining how we need to do it is instead of having this hierarchy where white people are up and other minorities are on lower levels you know we should have a flat hierarchy where everyone is on the same footing so yeah that's that's a uh i would say a cornerstone of my anarchical principles Okay. Um, Destiny, what are you, this is my question. What are your biggest, like, and I guess you've talked about this a lot in here, but just very generally, what are your biggest frustrations with the left? Um, my biggest frustrations with the left? 
Mm-hmm. I don't know. It usually has to do with like ascribing too much morality to an economic system where people start like moralizing like basic observations of like capitalist systems or when people have like really bad understandings of how any of these systems work. Like basically anytime AOC opens her mouth and talks about economics, like it just it's really cringy and the conversations aren't productive and none of the analyses are even factually correct. And it, I don't know that usually like my problem is like if somebody wants to come on and debate like a ton of theory or something like I'm OK with that. But when people start to have like really bad understandings of of, of capitalism or really bad understandings of economic systems, that's usually annoying. To be fair, people on the right do it too. I mean, you've got Ben Shapiro, you know, all the flooded global warming houses will just be sold. Like, you've got dumb analysis on both sides as well. Okay. Um, EJ, I have one question for you, and then I'll let you guys get the last word, and we can wrap it up because we've been going on for two, about two hours now. So, yep. EJ, uh, what, is, what, is you, um, what is your criticism to people that say leftists have unre- unrealistic expectations for their goals? What would you say to I those think, people? Yeah, I would just say that capitalism is incredibly unrealistic in terms of the promises that it makes and then the ways that it doesn't not only doesn't deliver but like delivers things that are completely counter to those promises and i think that if you really soberly look at the way that capitalism working and the way that it's affecting your life i mean i'm saying if you're a worker if you're a or especially if you're like a minority or you're disabled or something like that if you look at like the, the to me it's no surprise that a lot of the people who are coming into the fold of the left these days are people who are and this is why I say I'm an intersectionalist. Like if you're at the crux, if you're like a trans person, that means that you've experienced misogyny or, uh, or, or uh, some of the negative effects that men face from having like toxic masculinity. You've also experienced transphobia. Trans people tend to be more poor. So you've, you're more likely to have experienced poverty. You're like at the intersection of all these ways that the capitalist society oppresses you. So um, if, you're, if you're a person who feels like, you know, the system is just not working for you, look more deeply into capitalism and the way that it's come about and the histories of capitalist states and the way that we've imperialized the world and uh, and tell me how realistic it is the the promises that capitalism makes to us. Um, I guess that's my re- response to that question. Okay. Actually, I want to ask one more pet question that's relevant to the work that I do. And I guess I'll yeah. ask both of you and EJ, you can go then Destiny. Do, do okay. you guys think that, so we're seeing like all this radicalism, right? We're seeing, and it's not just from white supremacy, right? It's not just white nationalists. You see it in Islamic communities. You see, we've seen it in Japan before with cults like Am Um And I, I see it as like a lot of cult type behavior. And to me, it seems like the preconditions for this are very material. Um, do you guys yeah. think that by, you know, this is why I'm a progressive, right? Healthcare, education, housing, food, all that stuff. Do you guys think that that would reduce the radical behavior we see in our society? Or do you think that that's a kind of a pipe dream to think that it's that simple? I, th- uh, I think for sure, like, oh, sorry. No, um, I mean, I would say no, absolutely not. I mean... I, I think people are people are tribalistic by nature. To overcome these things requires like effort. If you want to make people not racist, the way that you do it is by having them affiliate with other people of other classes, um, or not other classes of other races, I should say, right? Like if you want white people to not hate black people, then they have to be raised together. They have to live in the same cities together. They have to work together. That these are the things that have to happen. Just because you have some like organization where people aren't poor or something, isn't going to magically make them not racist, you know, or, or whatever. Yeah. It takes exposure. EJ, do you want to add anything to that? No, I mean, I actually agree with a lot of what Destiny just said. I mean, like, I think that uh, my, my biggest concern, I think we're, uh, if, if, not, if no major changes are made, I think that fascism is going to get stronger as our ecology disintegrates, as our environment is destroyed. I think that, uh, you know, you're going to see, you're already seeing um, people talking about eco-fascism. The, the logical conclusion to me on the train that we're driving straight forward right now is that all these different little tribes or nations or whatever you want to call them they're going to fascistically want to wall off and like they're going to scramble for the resources that we have um as they actually do become increasingly scarce which as right now we have this window where scarcity i believe is a myth and we have other avenues we can take um but i don't think people are tribalistic by nature i think that that is a component of scarcity and i mean you could look at like there's a great article called ayn rand versus anthropology that talks a lot about how you know pre-agrarian societies are like super not uh violent and they're very like altruistic and communally focused um i don't think that our nature is like competitive and combative i think that it's uh it's it's from like centuries of trauma and abuse by the people who have the power over the people who don't um so yeah i do think that materially uh 
solving these problems of material inequality and, 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 and shitty distribution would definitely let off a lot of that tribalistic pressure. And it would allow us to go back to those, what we call now more primitive ways of just coming together and being more altruistically minded. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all I have for, for you guys. Do you guys want to say anything else? No, I think I'm good. Okay. I'll let Luna, you got any parting, parting thoughts, Luna? Just since you, <laughs> since you, since you jumped in, you might as well. Yeah, jump I out. just, I am, I, uh, I, I am not an anarcho communist, but there's one thing I do agree with anarcho communists. Is that you said that anarcho, anarchism is, is no end goal, right? Yeah. Yes, that's true because and I think that anarchism and communism is all about finding the problems and then fix this together, all mm -hmm. together. It's not about just like, oh, I see the problem, but I don't care because this is not my problem. Or you even like, uh, I want to be of them because I don't want to be killed by them. That's that. So instead of fighting them, fighting the, rob the problem to help yourself and other people, you will be one of them to help like oppress the other people. If Vietnam, Vietnamese people do that, we never win the war. Because yeah. instead of fighting France and America, why don't we become one of their soldiers <laughs> and then kill our own people? Yeah, that's it. And that's the thing I, I really agree about the anarcho communism. There's no end goal. There's always a problem. And, but the problem is that we have to be together to solve the problem, to have the best solution for everyone, for all the people from the trans L LGBTQ+. Plus, Chance people, black people, minority, Asian, POC like me, not just all about the white people. Okay. And that's it. Thank you, Luna. All right. Well, um, I, unless you guys have anything else to say, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. I just want to thank EJ, Luna, Dustin. I want to thank you guys all for coming. Thank everybody for watching. Um, uh, so just again, um, I'm working on a project for de-radicalization. So if anybody wants to come by the Discord channel, uh, we're always looking for volunteers to help. If there's any alt writers in the chat that want to come in and talk and uh, have conversations with people, you're more than welcome. Uh, someone will post a link in the chat there. And yeah, just thank you guys for coming on and thank you everybody for watching. Thank yeah, you. Thanks a lot for having me. All right. Bye. See you guys. Fair to you. Was it everything you dreamed it would be? Yeah, it was interesting. Was it? It's so much more interesting, like arguing with, um, like for alt writers or people that are like racist or whatever. Like um, usually conservatives make when conserv when lefties make like stupid claims, they're always founded in like the fantastical. Like it would kind of be like like if a lefty is coming up to argue with me, if a conservative is arguing with me, a conservative is going to say like socialized healthcare doesn't work. And it's like, well, okay, well, let's look at every single other OECD country and let's see if that's true. If a lefty comes up and argues with me, he would say like Snape is actually better than Voldemort. He was just holding back. It's like, fuck, dude. Like, I don't know how the fuck I'm supposed to have this fucking argument. What the fuck do you even want me to say? Like, come on, dude. Like, and that's like, and that's like, it's not that it's like a bad argument or that it's dumb or stupid. I just, it's like, well, in my world, like the workers wouldn't be that bad. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't be that racist and all the communes would form together and everybody would fall. And it's like, maybe like, I don't know. It feels like so idealized. Like, yeah. And then it's like, well, what are your examples? Well, Catalonia that existed for four years and was embittered in war, I mean, kind of war, and it's like. And I just want to be really clear. Okay. And I'm not saying you're doing this intentionally, obviously, but that is not what these agreements say.